Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee will come to order. Today's hearing is in the hybrid format. Our witness, of course, is in person. Members have the option to appear either way. We welcome the Chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, has recently been confirmed for a second uh, term and has, um, this is his first hearing since then. We've seen today, we've seen the fastest growth in decades, faster even than China's, the lowest unemployment levels in 50 years. When Americans see the price of gas and groceries and rent going up week after week, available jobs and long-awaited wage gains don't mean as much and don't go as far. American families have been through enough the past two years, but for most people, it's not just the past two years that have been tough. Our economy hasn't worked for most Americans for far too long. Whether it's war or disease or financial crisis or sweeping over all of it, the march of globalization, workers and their families always bear the biggest burden. Whether it's in the form of higher prices or lost jobs or low wages or devastation to their community or all of the above. It's not inevitable, this economy, the economy isn't physics. The ghost of Adam Smith would not recognize America today. There is no invisible hand of the market. When prices go up, it's because someone made a choice to raise them. In corporate boardrooms, when supply chains slow down or input costs go up or resources become scarce, executives make decisions. Do we cut back on bonuses? Do we rethink our stock buyback plan? Do we forego executive raises this year? Do we post quarterly profits that are still higher than last year, but maybe not quite as high as analysts thought they could be? Or, or do we raise prices and foist all the negative consequences of world events onto the people who can least afford them? We know what in this country most corporations do. They make the same choice they've always made, no matter the economic conditions of the moment. Most of these executives, they're not bad people, they're just doing their jobs, they tell us. It's the Wall Street system. These executives have to post profit increases for their shareholders quarter after quarter after quarter. The consequences for everything else be damned, and everyone else be damned. It's why for decades, Wall Street's rewarded the companies that squeeze their workers the hardest, companies that cut wages and retirement benefits, then cut corners on worker safety and a consumer protection just to make their stock prices go up. It's why too many companies fail to invest in their workers or their products. It's why companies moved manufacturing overseas and then neglected the supply chains that have been crippled during the pandemic, contributing mightily to inflation. It's why big corporations, Amazon, Starbucks, why they bust unions. It's why oil and gas companies would rather charge higher prices than increase supply to meet demand. We aren't, wishing, we aren't witnessing traditional inflation. We're watching Russia and OPEC drive up prices and American energy companies engage in wartime profiteering. At the root of the higher prices and the empty shelves are the same problem that's been shipping jobs overseas and keeping wages low for decades, from Nevada to Massachusetts to Ohio. Corporate power, concentration reaching into every industry and market, into every corner of the economy. Our economy doesn't have to be a zero-sum game where Wall Street wins, everyone else loses. We can create an economy that reflects our values and works for everyone. We passed the American Rescue Plan, including the child tax credit, the high, biggest tax cut for working families ever. And despite what naysayers claim, of course it wasn't the cause for inflation. For the American families that I talked to, it empowered them to keep up with the cost of raising children. We passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, a long-term long -term investment in economic growth that creates more jobs, strengthens supply chains, improves our bridges and roads and public transit. Last week, Last week, President Biden signed the Bipartisan Ocean Shipping Reform Act into law, bringing down ocean shipping supply chain costs. We need to build on these successes to build an economy that rewards work making things in America. We should pass our Supply Chain Resiliency Act and begin to bring manufacturing back to our country. We should bring down the cost of prescription drugs and housing and child care and elder care and other costs that have been raising for rising for decades. We need to pass the Protecting the Right to Organize Act to empower workers in the workplace and our economy so they actually get fair tree, fair, a fair, their fair share. We need to crack down on corporate concentration and consolidation. Fair competition is good for workers and consumers and Main Street businesses. It's a core American value. It's how, it's how we bring costs down and ensure that workers don't always pay the price for powerful people's bad decisions, whether it's a dictator in Eastern Europe or a Wall Street executive. 
In a truly fair economy, people don't have to choose between two bad options, low wages or high prices. No one likes inflation. People want good jobs that pay a living wage. Americans want to work. They want to work with dignity. That's central to the functioning of our economy. And as, as Chair Powell knows, it's part of the Fed's mandate. We must continue to power workers and strengthen the labor market. Wages are not clearly not responsible for inflation now. We can't forget that almost 6 million people are still looking for work, actual workers behind the numbers whose livelihoods are directly affected by the decisions the Fed makes. And as interest rates rise and financial stability risks increase, it's even more important to keep a close watch on the biggest banks so that excessive risk taking doesn't create even more problems. Banks must have enough capital to withstand a crisis. They must serve their communities, not just enrich themselves with stock buybacks and exorbitant executive pay, and mergers must benefit the local community, not just shareholders. We've seen too much evidence of big Wall Street banks behaving badly, shunning small businesses, raking in billions, still raking in billions in overdraft fees, dis discriminating all too often against black and brown uh, borrowers. Chair Powell, you must ins also ensure we have a strong payment system that works for Main Street banks and consumers so people don't feel like the only option is a risky and unregulated alternative financial system backed by nothing but empty promises. The thousands of proxy currencies like stablecoin and other digital assets, they promise transparency and, and they, they promise transparency and democracy are missing one thing. They aren't backed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America. The Federal Reserve, our nation's central bank, must use its authority to protect consumers and the financial system from these risks. And you, Mr. Chair, must ensure that the Fed has the highest ethical standards. After form, former Fed officials profited off their positions in last year's stock trading scandal. It's up to you to restore the American people's and us to restore the American people's trust in this institution that's critical for, critical for a healthy economy. I was encouraged when you updated the Fed's policies, but we need rules that have the force of law. That's why we need to pass my ban conflicted trading at the Fed Act. As chair of the Federal Reserve, you have an important role to play to make sure our economy works for everyone, not just those at the top. I urge you to remember the millions of working Americans who are counting on you. Uh, I will turn to the, today's ranking member, um, Mr. Tillis from North Carolina, uh, and then, Ms., then Chair Powell. And the first question uh, questioner will be Senator Warren, um, who has another engagement. Plus, it's her birthday. So she, every time birthday, she gets to go first if she has. And I have to introduce a judicial candidate and judiciary, so I may have to step up. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Your 80th birthday today, Senator Kennedy. <laughs> Senator Tellis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Chairman Powell. Congratulations on your confirmation. I was pr proud to support it. When you testified before this committee in March, inflation was at a 40 year high, and the Federal Reserve regional banks were stonewalling reasonable requests for information about their activities from banking Republicans. Unfortunately, neither situation has improved. Let's begin with inflation. Inflation is even higher now than we saw you in March. CPI is up 8.6 per year, a new 40-year high. Getting inflation under control is critical because American families are being squeezed every day by rising prices and mounting costs. Also critical to any discussion we have on inflation is an understanding of what served to turbocharge it. In March of 2021, the U.S. economy, as measured by the range of economic factors, was in recovery. Unemployment was at 6% down from its pandemic worst of nearly 15% and continuing to make steady monthly improvements towards a, high, a tighter labor market. In fact, 18 states already had unemployment rates below 5%. They often cite a threshold to identify a labor market that's almost at full capacity. Likewise, consumer spending had recovered and it was actually above pre-pandemic levels at 4.5%. And the personal savings rate had returned by 80% to its pre-pandemic state, indicating Americans were capable and willing to spend. Considering these factors and many others, CBO projected that the United States would return to pre-COVID economic levels and GDP output by mid-2021, just a couple of months away. At the same time, the Biden administration was aware of one major area of concern, the disruption of supply chains. In fact, President Biden issued a February 2021 executive order to review U.S. supply chains in part 
acknowledging they were already straining to meet rising consumer demand. Yet despite these facts, the soon to be recovered economy, a soon to be recovered economy, stronger consumer spending, and known limitations on supply side due to the documented supply chain issues, the Biden administration and congressional Democrats still somehow considered it responsible to ram through a partisan $1.9 trillion spending spree. It is little wonder how this catalyzed inflation we see today. And don't just take my word for it. Just last week, economists at Morgan Stanley blamed the 40-year high inflation on, this is a quote from their report, excess fiscal stimulus, particularly the last $1.9 trillion package at the end of March 2021, adding, this is what turbocharged consumption and drove inflation to 40-year highs. Considering this damning assessment of the last reconciliation package, I can only add that any efforts to revive Democrats' currently stalled tax and spending legislation would no doubt worsen our economic condition. Regarding the Fed specifically, though I'm pleased you have begun taking drastic action necessary to right the U.S. economy, these actions are long overdue and monetary policy remains too loose. CPI inflation now stands at 8.6% per year, a new 40-year high, but the Fed fund rate sits at 1.6%. According to the Fed's semi-annual report, the rate should be over 6% under the Taylor rule. This disparity indicates not only the lengths the Fed has yet to go to normalize monetary policy, but also the fact that the Fed has largely boxed itself in to a menu of purely reactive policy measures. Unless the Fed works quickly to move away from their discretion-based monetary policy approach that has remained consistently well behind the curve, I'm concerned the Fed will lose its credibility to effectively manage the national economic situation. Regarding congressional oversight of the Fed, I remain concerned that the Fed and its regional banks continue a pattern of stonewalling reasonable requests for information. The latest example concerns the fairness, transparency, and consistency of Fed decisions to granting highly valuable Fed master accounts. This is significant. This is a significant public policy issue. Ranking member Toomey, myself, Senator Lummis, and others have repeatedly requested information about this from the Fed and the Kansas City Fed, yet we have still have few, if any, answers. Just this month, the Kansas month, the Kansas City Fed refused to provide any information about its recent decision to revoke the master account for Reserve Trust, a non-bank fintech. This is significant given the controversy that arose in former Governor Raskin's nomination process when it was revealed that the Kansas City Fed reversed its denial of Reserve Trust application for a Fed master account following a call from Ms. Raskin. Now, months after defending the decision to grant Reserve Trust, a master account, the Kansas City Fed abruptly revoked the account without explanation. The Kansas City Fed won't give banking Republicans information or even a briefing about this curious reversal. And it's important to point out that Republicans aren't the only ones who have found it difficult to conduct Fed oversight. Several of my Democratic colleagues, including Senators Warren and Menendez, have been vocal when they also found their oversight efforts met with resistance. To address this unacceptable state of affairs, Congress should increase transparency at the Fed. Two simple steps that Republicans and Democrats can take together are subject the Fed banks to FOIA, which they currently are not, and forbid the Fed from using FOIA exemptions to withhold information from any member of commerce, Congress, not just committee chairmen. This is the second, the second idea is a bipartisan proposal that's already passed the House and something Senator Ossoff has mentioned with regard to various federal agencies in the past. Likewise, Congress should <clears throat> also explore making the presidents of the regional Fed banks presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed positions. This is another bipartisan idea as Senator Reid previously proposed this requirement for the New York Fed bank president position. And in 2015, Chairman Brown himself raised the idea during a banking committee hearing on reforms to the Fed. The time has come to revisit these sensible ideas and others in order to make the Fed more transparent and more accountable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to Chairman Powell's testimony. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, we'll hear from the Chair of the Federal Reserve on monetary policy, the state of our economy. Congratulations again on your second term, second confirmation to your second term. Thanks for your service and your testimony. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Senator Tillis, and other members of the committee. 
I appreciate the opportunity to present <clears throat> the Fed's semi-annual monetary policy report. I'll begin with one overarching message. At the Fed, we understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. It is essential that we bring inflation down if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ended in April, total PCE prices, that's personal consumption expenditures prices, rose 6.3% excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.9%. The available data for May suggests that the core measure likely held at that pace or eased slightly last month. Aggregate demand is strong, supply constraints have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated, and price pressures have spread to a broad range of goods and services. The surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is boosting prices for gasoline and fuel and is creating additional upward pressure on inflation. And COVID-19 related lockdowns in China are likely to exacerbate ongoing supply chain disruptions. Over the past year, inflation also increased rapidly in many foreign economies as discussed in a box in the June monetary policy report. Overall economic activity edged down in the first quarter as unusually sharp swings in inventories and net exports more than offset continued strong underlying demand. Recent indicators suggest that real GDP growth has picked up this quarter with consumption spending remaining strong. In contrast, growth in business fixed investment appears to be slowing <clears throat> and activity in the housing sector looks to be softening, in part reflecting higher mortgage rates. The tightening in financial condition, conditions that we've seen in recent months should continue to temper growth and help bring demand into better balance with supply. The labor market has remained extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50-year low, job vacancies at historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Over the past three months, employment rose by an average of 408,000 jobs per month, down from the average pace seen earlier in the year but still robust. Improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. A box in the June monetary policy report discusses developments in employment and earnings across all major demographic groups. Labor demand is very strong, while labor supply remains subdued, with the labor force participation rate little changed since January. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation poses sig significant Thanks hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. Against the backdrop of the rapidly evolving economic environment, our policy has been adapting and it will continue to do so. With inflation well above our longer run goal of 2% and an extremely tight labor market, we raised the target range for the federal funds rate at each of our past three meetings, resulting in a one and a half percentage point increase in the target range so far this year. The committee reiterated that it anticipates that ongoing increases, increases in the target range will be appropriate. In May, we announced plans for reducing the size of our balance sheet and shortly thereafter began the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. Financial conditions have been tightening since last fall and have now tightened significantly, reflecting both policy actions uh, that we have already taken as well as anticipated actions. Over coming months, we'll be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down consistent with inflation returning to 2%. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. The pace of those changes will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. We will make our decisions meeting by meeting and will continue to communicate our thinking as clearly as possible. 
Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Making appropriate monetary policy in this uncertain environment requires a recognition that the economy often evolves in unexpected ways. Inflation has obviously surprised to the upside over the past year, and further surprises could be in store. We therefore will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. And we will strive to avoid adding uncertainty in what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain time. We are highly attentive to inflation risks and determined to take the measures necessary to restore price stability. The American economy is very strong and well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. <clears throat> to conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me, on behalf of uh, Chairman Brown, recognize Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chairman. I appreciate the help of the Chairman this morning. And thank you for being with us, Chair Powell. So Americans are struggling with rising costs, and all eyes turn to the Fed. Last week, you announced that the Fed would raise rates by three quarters of a percentage point, the biggest increase in nearly 30 years. So let's talk about what the Fed is and isn't doing when it raises interest rates to try to bring down inflation. Let's start with gas prices. The price of gas is up 40% since Russia invaded Ukraine in February. Chair Powell, will gas prices go down as a result of your interest rate increase? I would not think so, no. Okay. Um, and um, that matters because gas prices are one of the single biggest drivers of inflation. Energy prices overall drove a third of the inflation last month, but the Fed's tools, as you say, have no impact here. So let's look at another necessity, food. Price of groceries is up nearly 12% this year. Americans feel the pinch. No matter how much groceries cost, people still got to eat. Chair Powell, will the Fed's interest rate increases bring food prices down for families? No, I, I wouldn't say so, no. Okay. So a Fed increase won't bring down these prices. And why? Because rate hikes won't make Vladimir Putin turn his tanks around and leave Ukraine. Rate hikes won't break up monopolies. Rate hikes won't straighten out the supply chain or speed up ships or stop a virus that is still causing lockdowns in some parts of the world. So let's talk about what interest rate increases can do. Chair Powell, you said last week that interest rate increases, quote, moderate demand. Can you just explain a little more about what that means? Sure. So uh, we, we think about uh, interest rate increases as affecting financial conditions and then the economy through three broad channels, the first of which is uh, interest-sensitive spending. So that's durable goods and automobiles and things like that. So interest rates go up. Uh, people's demand for, uh, as a result of higher interest rates, will, will, will moderate or decline so that supply and demand can get into better balance. The second channel is just asset prices generally. Uh, interest rates, as they go up, will cause asset prices to moderate across the economy, and people spend a little bit less out of their, out of their lower, lower level of wealth. The third channel is the exchange rate, which is really just another asset price. And that just uh, basically, as, as, uh, as the dollar strengthens, uh, um, sorry, as, as rates go up, uh, the dollar would strengthen, which would um, uh, tend to, to drive. Uh, so I appreciate this. And I do. I appreciate the explanation. But let me just see if I can just put a little uh, uh, more plain vanilla uh, explanation of what's going on here. If I understand what you've said and what economists are saying across the board is that when you raise interest rate, there's going to be less money to invest. And that is, it's going to dampen business investment. Is that a fair statement? I, I think the idea is to Makes it more expensive moderate demand to invest. so that it can be in better balance with supply. Okay. And this, so the current it's going to make it more demand is well in excess of if supply in some areas of our economy. More expensive to invest, which in turn is going to throw workers out of work. And when they're out of work, they have less money to spend. So I get that rate increases stop companies from spending money to build new plants or to buy new trucks or to hire new people. 
Right, Chair Powell, when money's more expensive, they're less inclined to do that. I think that's what you just said on asset pricing, right? Well, in the labor market, you have, as you know, you have uh, a situation where there's a shortage of workers and there are two, va two job vacancies for every person who's actively looking for work. So part of this is to get the labor market back into balance. Well, I, I, I appreciate you call it back into balance. What I'm trying to get at, though, is what does the tool of raising rates do? And part of what you just said is that it increases, in effect, the cost to invest, to buy those trucks or new plants or to hire new people. The reason I raise this and the reason I'm so concerned about this is rate increases make it more likely that companies will fire people and slash hours to shrink wage costs. Rate increases also make it more expensive for families to do things like borrow money for a house. And so far, the cost this year of a mortgage has already doubled. Uh, inflation is like an illness, and the medicine needs to be tailored to the specific problem. Otherwise, you could make things a lot worse. And right now, the Fed has no control over the main drivers of rising prices. But the Fed can slow demand by getting a lot of people fired and making families poorer. And while President Biden is working to increase energy supplies and straighten out supply chain kinks and break up monopolies and bring down prices, you could actually tip this economy into recession. So I just want to say, you know what's worse than high inflation and low unemployment? It's high inflation and a recession with millions of people out of work. And I hope you'll reconsider that as you drive this, before you drive this economy off a cliff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. On behalf of Chairman Brown, Senator Tillis, please. Uh, Senator Reid, I'm going to defer and allow Senator Shelby to go before me, and then I'll follow in turn. Quite all right, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, earlier this month, Secretary Yellen acknowledged she was wrong about the risk of inflation. Previously, uh, you also acknowledged that the Fed got it wrong in thinking that inflation would be transitory. Yet myself and other members of this banking committee here have been warning about inflation for over a year. Last July, nearly one year ago, when you came before this committee, I raised my concerns about the risk of rising inflation, particularly following the enactment of a $2 trillion spending bill. At that time, there was already evidence that inflation was affecting numerous areas of our economy. I discussed the year-to-year -year price increases on agricultural goods such as corn, wheat, and soybeans at that time. I pointed out the rising cost of metals, including copper and aluminum. I mentioned the increase in energy prices, used cars and airline tickets. As someone who remembers, and I do from this committee, encountering high inflation during the 70s, I warned that many of the same conditions present then, such as loose monetary policy, and significant government spending were occurring again, among other things. My main concern last year was that the Federal Reserve would fail to address rising inflation before it was too late. Eleven months later, this concern has come to fruition. And as we sit here today, inflation, as you've already pointed out, is at a 40-year high. The average gas price is over $4, $5 a gallon. And we are currently in the midst of 12 consecutive months of inflation above 5%, including spiking to 86 <clears throat> last month. Ultimately, Mr. Chairman, as inflation continues to run rampant, I believe the Federal Reserve and this administration failed the American people by not heeding these warnings a year ago and by not acting sooner to address it. We're where we are today. I know that. The consequences of being wrong on inflation are now being felt, has been pointed out here today, by American families and workers across the country. And despite the recent decision to raise interest rates, the Federal Reserve still has a long way to go to get inflation under control. What, do, what can we expect in the future uh, from the Federal Reserve? And I know you don't have total control over inflation, but you have a lot of sticks there, and what will you use to bring this under control. Thank you, Senator. So um, financial conditions, of course, have tightened and have priced in a, a, you know, a string of additional rate increases, and, and that's appropriate. 
Well, as you pointed out, and as Senator Tillis pointed out as well, our policy rate is only at 1.6 percent, but all out the curve that the market is pricing in increases. So financial condi conditions already reflect, have already priced in additional rate increases. But we need to go ahead and have them. And I think that the, the most recent inflation indicators uh, of various kinds suggest to us that we need to accelerate, we needed to accelerate the pace at which we get up to a level that is, that is neutral, that, that is close to the longer run neutral level, and then we can make an assessment of how much further and faster to go. And so that's what we're doing. I think you can see from, uh, from the moves we're, we're making now that we do understand the, the full scope of the problem, and we're, we're using our tools to address it pretty, uh, pretty vigorously now. Mr. Chairman, explain to us again how important one of your mandates is price stability, how important price stability is to all Americans. So price stability is really the bedrock of the economy in, in this sense, in the sense that you, you, you really cannot have a sustained period of maximum employment, our other co-equal goal. You can't have that without price stability. And so we must, must re restore price stability, and we will. We have the tools and the resolve and hopefully the judgment to, you know, to, to, to accomplish that task. What's essential you, that we do. What's your next step? Well, I, uh, if, if you look at the market has been, has been um, I think, reading our, our reaction function reasonably well, and I think you, what you will see is continued uh, progress toward, uh, expeditious progress toward higher rates. I'll, I'll say this, the committee, the, the center of the committee wrote down uh, that rates would be between 3 and 3.5% three and by the end of this year, as of a few weeks ago, is as, this as one week ago. Is this Federal Reserve Board of Governors, under your leadership, committed, as Dr. Volcker was some 40 years ago, to bring an inflation under control no matter what? I, I would never want to try to compare myself to Paul Volcker in any way, but, but I will say that we are strongly, strongly committed to restoring price stability. We do understand that it's, it is the thing that we need so that we can get back to the kind of labor market that we all want but reach, reaching the standard that Volcker left at the Fed would be a high reach, but one that anybody there should try to uh, get there, wouldn't it? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shelby. I'll exercise my time now. Um, Mr. Chairman, you point out in your testimony that the core uh, personal consumption expenditures, minus gas, food, and rent, 4.9 percent, and even slightly declined from the previous report. So that leaves the, the real culprits, uh, gas, food, and rent. Uh, first, the, the issue of gas price inflation is a global phenomenon. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, g gas prices are a function of oil prices to a, to a significant extent, and then, and then you know, the, the refining spread as well. Right. And uh, that has been exacerbated by the Ukraine uh, invasion. Uh, we've deliberately, and the Europeans have deliberately cut off uh, uh, accessing Russian supplies, and that's added to inflation. And the other problem, also with, with in hydrocarbons, it's a cartel that sets the price. Is that accurate? Sorry, what's a cartel? It's oh, a you cartel mean? that sets the price yes. of oil worldwide. Yes, globally, uh, that, that cartel has a very major impact on the price of oil. And they have decided uh, uh, to, that uh, further production is not as lucrative to them as just sitting back and, and making money. That's what it appears like. Uh, with respect to food, there are multiple factors there also. W one is climate. Uh, we've seen loss of arable land. We've seen a lot of factors. All of this is outside the purview of the Federal Reserve, but I think it's helpful to understand what are driving forces in these price increases. Uh, Transportation issues with respect to food, that's a function of higher diesel costs, a function of lack of drivers. Uh, again, the Ukraine, a significant uh, amount of wheat is not being exported from Ukraine or from Russia, as well as fertilizers. That's driving the price. And then the rental uh, affordable housing issue, that has been a crisis since I became a congressman in 1990. I recall marching in Washington for affordable housing in 1990. We just don't have enough. Uh, and that, I think, is a factor, too. Is, uh, are those the, the major causes for these increases in prices? 
Those are some of the major ones. Uh, you know, you could also point to um, uh, some parts of the goods economy, uh, which have been restrained at restrained capacity. And you're actually seeing significant uh, price increases in some of the service economy as it really reopens fully now. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be the, the travel and leisure sector. There's another right. issue, too. We talked about the, the cartels that dominate hydrocarbons. But we found, for example, during the pandemic that there are really just four major meat processes in the United States. And with four rather than a multiple of that, uh, there is the ability to uh, indirectly uh, restrain uh, supply and raise increase prices. In fact, some of my colleagues, particularly in the House, have been talking about the antitrust as aspects of some of these price increases. Is that a plausible ingredient to the problem, too? So I, I I think that's really a matter for the competition authorities, not for us. But sure, some I think, are, broadly speaking, our economy is is very competitive. There there will be some industries where that's uh, that's less so the case. So th 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 these range of, of you have to take action, and your basically tool is interest rates and uh, going in and out of buying public securities. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do too which is to try to resolve some of these issues. Uh, uh, and we have to do it uh, in order to assist your efforts, the fiscal policy and other policy. I was very pleased to see the president sign the legislation with respect to shipping reform. Uh, that's a step. But we have to do much more, too. Is that accurate? I think that's, that's really a question for you. We're very focused on uh, sticking to our knitting and uh, carrying out the task that we've been assigned. Uh, no, I appreciate that. And uh, the independence of the Fed is something that has to be protected uh, by everyone, including particularly yourself. Uh, a, a final sort of issue that I'm uh, thinking of, th we're at a, a, a tremendous, I think, turning point in our economy. Factors that 10, 15 years ago were not active, things like social media, et cetera. But one other fact, too, with respect to hydrocarbons is uh, I, perhaps the companies are either unconsciously or consciously limiting investment because they're anticipating an electrified uh, power supply, electric cars, electric everything. Is that something that the Fed is looking at? I, I think that is certainly, um, if you pick up the annual report of any of the big oil companies, you'll see that that is something that, that is happening. And it's a, it's a rational economic uh, response to you know, expectations about where future policy is headed. No, I, again, I think there are so many factors here, but I think it's good to get some of them on the table. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. With that, let me recognize Senator Tillis. Thank you, Senator Reid. Um, again, Chair Powell, thank you for being here. Um, by the Fed's own analysis of various policy rules, including the Taylor Rule, the Revised Taylor Rule, the Balanced Approach Rule, and the Balanced Approach Shortfall Rule, rates should have begun to rise long before they did. According to the Fed's own analysis of these rules, the Fed's fund rate should currently be above 6%. This is in a report to Congress. Yet the rate currently stands at 1.6%. Likewise, these same rules would would have prompted, should have prompted the Fed to begin raising rates Q4 last year, Q1 this year. I'm concerned to the, I'm, I'm concerned that the Fed has opted out of rules based to discretionary mon monetary policy. As the Fed reviews monetary policy strategy, Chair Powell, will you commit to considering an increased weight for a rules based strategy in Fed decision making? And if not, why? So um, we do use policy rules like the various forms of the Taylor rule in, in all of the analysis that we do. You know, there's, if, if you're thinking about how monetary policy will affect the economy, you have to have some sort of a rule like that. Fed has never really used them in a prominent way to actually set policy in real time. Um, but that's not to say they don't shed light. And we do consult them. At, at, you know, we, we consult them on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, they, the, the rules called for deeply, deeply negative rates during the pandemic, and, and we didn't do that. Uh, they did call, of course, for rates to move up, and rates now really are moving up much closer to where the, the Taylor Rule, various forms of the Taylor Rule are, and I think by the end of the year we'll be, we'll be uh, 
will be pretty close to where some of the Taylor Rule iterations are. So it's something that we consider. I think in a couple of years when we, when we uh, uh, look at our framework again, that's something we could look at. And Chair Powell, could you just briefly explain uh, the, the variance between rules-based decision-making being at six and where we are today? What, what other factors came into play? So what Taylor rules don't keep, they don't take into consideration changes in financial conditions. They just look at the overnight policy rate. As I mentioned earlier, we began signaling and you know, the way we're set up now to signal um, policy changes going forward with the summary of economic projections that we, we do four times a year. So markets priced that in and you're getting a lot of policy tightening well in advance of actually raising rates. As you pointed out, we're at 1.6% only on the, on the federal funds rate. But look, look out at the rate curve, all the very substantial additional rate hikes are already priced in and they're affecting financial conditions and they have been for several months. So um, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. It's really only the, at the very short end of the curve where, uh, where rates are still in negative territory from a real perspective. If you, if you look farther out, real rates are positive right across the curve. And that's, that's really what you're trying to achieve with policy in a situation like this, where we have 40 year highs in inflation and, and we know we need to have restrictive policy and, and that's, that's where we're headed. Thank you. In 2012, the Fed adopted its current 2% inflation target, then amended this in 2020 to allow inflation to run over 2% target uh, so that inflation averages 2% over time. Many warned this approach would simply give inflation a foothold before the Fed could respond. Now inflation's at 6.5% per year, and many serious analysts are predicting a recession. According to the Fed's framework, will the Fed push inflation below 2% so that it averages 2% over time? No, the, that wasn't the way the framework worked. And I, I should clarify, though, the, the, the framework was, was carefully focused on what we knew, which was the, the economy of the last 25 years. The pandemic hit a few months afterward, and I think we've been aware since reasonably quickly after that, 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 that the de disinflationary forces of the last quarter century have been replaced at least temporarily by a whole different set of forces. And those are the forces that our policy is, 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 has been reacting and, 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 uh, uh, and dealing with. And we're well aware of that. I think that what we were looking at was a world in which uh, you, would, you didn't see inflation move up even when unemployment was for an extended period well below 4%. This is a different economy, different forces. The real question is how long will this new, uh, this new set of forces be sustained? And we can't know that. But in the meantime, our job is to find price stability and maximum employment in this new economy. And final question is there is some renewed discussions about increased spending and increased taxes through reconciliation. Just hypothetically, if Congress were to pass a bill that uh, increased spending by half a trillion or a trillion dollars and raised taxes, would that make your job easier or more difficult? Um, I swore off uh, uh, getting involved in these fiscal debates uh, a year or so ago, and I'm, I'm determined to, to see if I can't stick to that. Um, but remember, we can, we, we can always incorporate, and what we do is we take fiscal policy as given, and we react appropriately. Well, then, then maybe instead of policy working through Congress, but policy that was passed by Congress, do you believe that the $1.9 trillion spending package last year had any effect on oh, inflation? I, I'd, I'd really, this is really not our job to, you know, to uh, pass judgment. We didn't pass judgment on the uh, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or the CARES Act or, 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 or that act as well, the, the ARP. So. I really think that's a job for, for uh, Congressional Budget Office. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Senator Cortez Masta of Nevada is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. Let, let me start with uh, high prices, um, because not only in Nevada, but across the country, we're seeing high food, housing, and gas prices, which uh, really is creating a, a financial hardship for too many families. Um, and I want to start with gas prices first. In Nevada, uh, average price of gas is $5.60. In Las Vegas, about five sixty. dollars in, in Reno, at $6 uh, a gallon. And as gas prices rise across the country, oil and gas companies, we know, are making record profits, but are using that money to continue to consolidate their industry and pay for stock buybacks instead of investing in increased oil production. 
uh, on one of them, and what I've heard is over 9,000 permits that they have that are unused drilling permits, um, or they're not expanding their refining capacity. We also know that reduced finding capacity is a particular problem that has been caused in large part by decades of oil industry consolidation and is driving gas price hikes to be as much as 61 cents a gallon higher than expected. So when considering the drivers of inflation, how much do Federal Reserve economists consider consolidation in an industry? And what else can we do to hold these industries accountable for their, contr their contributions to rising prices? You know, we're, so those are really questions for the competition authorities, questions of industry structure and consolidation. They, they really aren't uh, questions that we directly address. You know, we raise interest rates and our job is maximum employment. But, but, but I have to push back. You have to consider that. I mean, you're considering what's happening in Ukraine as a variable on inflation and high prices. So you have to consider the fact that we have these oil companies they are exclusively control this commodity that is key for, for this country. We know that not only do they produce and decide how and when they're gonna drill crude oil, we also know the refineries, and quite honestly, the refineries in this country are not prepared to refine the domestic oil that even comes from Texas and the Dakotas. The refineries are prepared uh, to refine the oil that comes uh, from out of this country. And we also know that many of the oil companies have their own traders that are trading on the price of crude oil in this country. I mean, listen, you just talked about an outside agency. Uh, and this is why this is so important and why I am a co-sponsor of the Transportation Fuel Market Transparency Act. Glencore was just fined $1.1 billion because they were manipulating uh, the fuel oil, oil prices to their benefit. So that is something you have to take into consideration when we have an industry like these gas and oil companies that are so consolidated, they are having an impact on the prices to the detriment of the people in my state. So that has to be something you consider and take into consideration when you're looking at the impact that the people across the country are, are seeing from these high prices. I hope it is. Please tell me you are. Well, I, th I think we see that the global oil prices, which have you know, very important effects on, on gas prices here at home are set on the global market. And that, as we mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a large cartel that is responsible to a significant extent for setting those prices. We take that as given. So do you pay attention to what, what is, uh, Wall Street is saying and what these cartels are doing? When you say cartels, these are these big oil companies and they're indicating that, well, I'm not going to drill because I'm making profits because the price of gas is so high. So. Uh, you would assume, uh, I would as uh, hope that you would take that into consideration, that it's going to continue these high prices because uh, there is a challenge in holding these oil companies accountable. So we, we, in principle, we pay attention to anything that could affect the, the use of our tools and the need to use our tools. And I think with, with, uh, uh, you know, with the future price of oil, uh, the, the, best, the best thing you can probably do is look at oil futures because that futures, in, in theory, should be taking into account taking into account all of these factors, and that's what we do. But ultimately, the question for us is, do we raise or lower interest rates? We don't have tools that would address these, these practices that you're discussing. They're not really, of course, we, we understand them. Well, do you have concerns matter. that these oil companies are manipulating or controlling the prices that we have right now? Does that, do you take that into consideration in, with the tools that you need to uh, reduce inflation and reduce these costs? Honestly, the, those are not judgments for us to make. We're, you know, the questions about industry structure and competition are really not, it's not our assignment. Our assignment but is the outcome, employment and price the, stability. The outcome of that infrastructure is something you've got to take into consideration. Yes, very Unless much. they change, the prices are not coming down. <clears throat> Unless they stop giving profits and sharing that with their shareholders and start addressing and looking at actually the consumer at the other end of this, who is bearing the brunt of it, these prices are not going to come down. I, I would assume you take that into consideration. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, when you say take it into consideration, we, we, we do have to have a, a forecast of oil prices, and we do. But um, ultimately, though, the question for us is, is price inflation. What's happening with price inflation? And it's a macroeconomic question. It's not a question about industry structure or corporate behavior. It's a question about what will be the behavior of inflation across the economy. And in particular, we don't. We, we, there's really not anything that we can do about oil prices. 
There's a little, you know, food prices is, is a bit more mixed, but for oil prices, they're set at the global level. It has to do with, with global oil prices and also refining, the refining spread. Neither of these are things that we have the tools to affect. Does it concern you that these oil companies haven't come to the table to look for a solution to help us reduce, I, honestly, reduce fuel I, costs? I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for the Fed or for me to be reaching out into areas of policy that are not assigned to us. I, it's, it's not up to us to comment on, on that sort of thing. We, we have a very specific job and, and precious independence to, to carry that job out. And I think the other side of that is stick to that job. And our job is maximum employment and price stability. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My time is up. Thank you, Senator Cortez Maslow. Senator Rounds from South Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Powell, welcome again. Uh, it seems as though for the last couple of times that, that we've had you in front of this committee, inflation has been a primary item of discussion. Um, I, I want to follow up just as my colleagues have, and I'd like to take it uh, in, in a little bit different path, perhaps. Because when it comes to, to breaking down the different causes of inflation, clearly there is the supply side and the demand side. And the reality is that a large portion of the inflation stems from the higher energy prices, which is part of the supply side I issue. When President Biden took office um, January of 2021 through January of 2022, the price of unleaded gas has increased by 50% during that time period from 233 to about 330 per gallon. Now that was well before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Higher prices are instead, I believe, a direct result of policy decisions made by the Biden administration, like prohibiting new oil and gas leases on public lands and waters and choking off uh, future access through the Keystone XL pipeline and increasing U.S. dependence on foreign energy sources by actively calling on OPEC to produce more oil. All of these seem to send a terrible message to the market about the future of investing in oil and gas uh, um, uh, processes within the United States. And at the same time, Mr. Chairman, your tools are designed, as we've discussed in the past, to impact not necessarily the supply side, but the demand side of inflation. So if you attempt to use your tools that are available at this time to address what I believe to be the policy-induced side of inflation, do you risk hurting the economy by using these, these interest rate increases when in effect, as you've indicated earlier here in this, in this, uh, in this meeting, that you really can't impact the price of gas or the price of food. So, I think that's right. We, we know that our tools can't affect uh, certain aspects of, of uh, inflation, and that would include certainly energy inflation and, and food inflation. So um, nonetheless, our, our, our statutory goal is headline inflation. But we also know that core inflation is actually a better indicator of, of headline inflation than headline inflation itself is, because food and energy tend to be quite volatile. They tend to move up and move down, and that's, that's been the history. So core, core enables us to look through that volatility, and, and so we focus very much on that as, uh, as a better representation of what underlying inflation of the economy is at any given time. And, and I think, it, but in this particular case, that core inflation, if, if we're not going to include some of those what I think earlier we thought would be transitory in nature portions of inflation, they have proven not to be transitory. In fact, South Dakotans are now paying $682 more per month on goods and services than they were when President Biden took office due to inflation. The administration is claiming the Federal Reserve can fix our inflation problem. But as you've just indicated, you focus on core, and your tools might very well work on core, but not on those really heavy drivers to inflation that South Dakotans are seeing like the rest of the country. See, Mr. Chairman, what I believe is going to happen here, and I just share this, clearly you are aware that you're going to be the person that takes the fall if inflation is not brought under control. And this administration is going to point to you and to the Federal Reserve saying you have the tools to fix inflation and you're not doing your job, when in essence, the portion of inflation which Americans are feeling today may not just be the core inflation that some of your tools do, but the total cost of inflation 
that my citizens in South Dakota feel to the tune of, well, $682 more per month in living expenses than what they were when this administration took office. So we're focused on the part of it that we can address, and that is there's a job to do on demand here. There are parts of the economy where demand exceeds supply, and that's where we think our okay. tools can help, and, and, and that's what we're focused on. Very good. Just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, on another item, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision issued a press release indicating that it had made or substantive technical changes to the calculation of the GSIB score for EU-based global systemically important banks, the GSIBs. Do you, uh, the Federal Reserve is being a part of this, this organization, do you believe um, right now that this change reflects the views of the Federal Reserve as an influential member of the Basel Committee? Apparently, it looks like this may very well provide uh, some advantages to our European banks over U.S. banks based upon this reassessment of uh, how they view risk within the, uh, the EU community. So my, my understanding of that is that it, it, it's really about dis supervisors being able to use discretion about transactions that go across national lines within, within the, the European EU. Union. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't apply at all here. Um, and ultimately, the, the capital rules that, that, that Europeans apply are, are, are decided by Europeans, not by us. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, Senator uh, Warner from Virginia is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman Powell, it's, a, it's good to see you again. Thank you for your, your service to our country. Um, I, I want to go a couple of different directions. First, uh, and I think some colleagues have already raised this, but the truth is what we're grappling with right now on inflation is clearly a, a global phenomena. Uh, I think even the Cato Institute group that doesn't always necessarily agree with folks on my side of the aisle have, have uh, pointed out inflation in many industrial countries around the world is running at the same rates, if not higher than us. I frankly just returned uh, from a bipartisan trip to Finland, Latvia, and Turkey, getting back uh, late last night. I was still a little bit jet lagged. And Turkey, I think inflation is running at 78% a year. Um, Finland gas prices were at uh, uh, $9 a gallon, and I asked one of my your Republican colleagues, you know, it's amazing. Joe Biden's inflation hitting here in, in Finland, too. Um, the point being that a lot of these effects are, are not due to any single country's activities, but it is a, a global effect. I think colleagues have already acknowledged the effect that the Russia-Ukraine war has, uh, some of the disruption on supply chains. What I don't think <clears throat> has been fully addressed yet is um, some of the challenges that are coming around from China in terms of their zero COVID policy, a lockdown on, on Shanghai for literally months on end, and how that supply chain disruption is, is floating through uh, uh, the whole global economy. Can you, can you speak to that, Mr. Chairman? Sure. So, you, of course, you're right. Uh, inflation is very much a global phenomenon. If you look at comparable large advanced economies like ours, you'll see inflation rates that are quite similar to ours, in some cases higher, some cases lower. But there are important differences in the characteristics of that inflation. Ours is more about demand, I would say, than most of the others. Uh, and theirs is more about energy prices and things like that. In terms of your question on China, um, we really, we don't think we've seen the full effect of the, of the lockdowns that we, we've had. But we, so we'll expect to be seeing some uh, negative effects on bottlenecks. On the other hand, China now seems to be uh, coming out of that period of lockdown. And growth seems to be picking up. Indi advanced indicators are that their economy may be recovering. But of course, the zero COVID policy, um, as long as it's in place, it, it certainly could, you could certainly have a relapse uh, given this highly contagious disease. Let me, um, and, and again, we're all looking for um, short term items. And frankly, uh, I'm glad that the president, I know particularly some folks on my side of the aisle are concerned about the president visiting Saudi Arabia and visiting with the, the leadership of that regime. I think it's, you've got to use all the tools in the toolkit and getting additional partners in the middle, or players in the Middle East to increase oil production, I think is important. I'm a little less, um, I got a lot more proof to see whether some kind of short-term gas tax holiday uh, would actually provide relief to consumers or simply, uh, as we've seen in some states that have implemented it, um, the prices don't change and the companies may make more money, but it's, it doesn't provide that kind of inflationary relief. And I am concerned as somebody who spent a long time as governor and as senator trying to make sure we pay for our infrastructure investments, 
easy to take away a tax, tough to put it back on, uh, and there's always an excuse not to, but uh, I'm, I'm open to seeing a, a better analysis. I do want to raise, in, recognizing that not everything can be done with a flick of the switch, you know, there's a piece of legislation that has been floating around here for almost a year, passed the Senate a year ago on a broadly bipartisan basis, uh, passed the House a number of months ago. I think the House, frankly, took it the wrong approach. Um, but it goes at at least one of the inflationary pressures here, which is making sure that we've got a domestic supply chain on semiconductor chips. Every device that has an on and off switch is, requires a semiconductor chip. And right now, we see, particularly around auto inflation, one of the big drivers is the lack of chip supply so cars can't actually be sold. They're sitting, literally sitting warehouse waiting for the semiconductors to come around. This legislation, $52 billion of investment, would build at least 10 semiconductor facilities here in America. I know Senator Brown has been a big advocate of this. Um, if we don't do this, I don't think there'll be another semiconductor facility built in America, even though some have been announced. Uh, I point out the fact that you know, a year ago, the Europeans had no plan here in, in semiconductor investment. Intel recently announced $8 billion from the German government. When the German bureaucracy and European bureaucracy moves faster than the American legislative process, I don't care which side of the aisle we're on, we're in trouble. Uh, so in the last few seconds, uh, I know you don't want to weigh in on a specific um, piece of legislation, but the notion of investment in a key industry component like semiconductors, long term in terms of keeping inflationary pr pressures down, right move or not. Well, again, I wouldn't, as you say, I wouldn't comment on a specific legislative proposal. Talk about I'll the just, industry I'll sector. Just say, I'll just say that uh, I do think we learned a lot about global supply chains, and we're still learning. And it's important to take the right lessons, and, and I, I think it's a, you know, an important uh, area to explore about how we can harden up and improve our, our uh, sourcing capabilities, including what, deserve, what should be here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Senator Warner. Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Um, Mr. Chairman, inflation is uh, is just an imbalance of supply and demand. Can we agree on that? Yes, generally. And uh, to, to put a little finer point on it, um, our inflation at this time, and this is the case with respect to most cases of inflation, demand is greater in, than supply, so prices go up. In some parts of the economy, yes. Right. Now, you're trying to lower, so, so we've got a situation where demand's up here, supply's down here. You're trying to lower demand. Is that correct? Yes, while, while also giving the supply side time to recover. There's, there's some ground to be covered on that side. Yes, but you're, 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 you've talked about your role, scope, and mission. And your job is monetary. You're trying to lower demand. Well, I'm trying to lower. Well, I would say lower demand growth. We don't know that it has to. The demand has to actually go down, which would be a recession. Well, well, seventy percent of our economy is is uh, is uh, driven by consumer demand, and you're trying to lower demand to and slow the economy down. Am I correct? Slowly, I'm, I, I guess I just say we're slowing down growth. We, right. If, if, That's if, what the economy is. The growth. growth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. There's another way. The two aren't exclusive. You alluded to that. You <clears> can also <throat> lower demand, but you can increase supply. Can you not? Yes. And that would solve inflation. Yes, it would. Now, Congress's job is not to deal with with uh, d demand per se, a lot of the bills we pass impact demand, but but that's the Fed's job. Right. Okay. Now, I'm not going to ask you to comment on any specific bill, but tell me the things that Congress could do right now while you're lowering demand, not you literally, the Federal Reserve. What we can do right now to increase supply. So I, I think the things that you can do are important over the medium and longer term, but but probably not so much in the in the short term but it's things things that like investing in people so that they can remain in the labor market longer things like that and uh, you know in, infrastructure things again things that things that will make that will increase the productive capacity well how about I, but, well in the long run as Keynes said we're all dead I'm interested right now in the short run um, what about re, if, if we reduce the regulatory burden 
let's say, on refineries, wouldn't that incent refineries to start refining more and help on the supply side? I would say anything that could increase capacity on that front could, could have a Yeah, but would that help? I'm not trying to get you to endorse legislation. Look, Mr. Chairman, we got a hell of a mess here. Okay? We, we, inflation is hitting my people so hard they're coughing up bones. I, I don't care what the inflation is in other parts of the, country, in, of the world. I'm sorry they're having inflation in other parts of the world, but th them in misery doesn't make my people feel better. They're still miserable. Inflation is hitting people so hard, they're coughing up bones. It's the highest in 40 years. Our national, national debt is greater than our national output. Um, crime's up. The border's open. Respect for institutions uh, is way down. And 70% of the American people think we're headed in the wrong direction. Now, we got a hell of a mess. And right now, you're, you're the most powerful man in the United States maybe in the world. We've got to get, I mean, President Biden, I don't blame him. I understand politics. He keeps saying, well, um, your 401k has crashed and gas has gone from two bucks to five bucks a gallon because the economy's so good. And the American people know that's not true. Now, other than re relieving regulatory burden, well, let, me, let me put it in the form of a question. What if the United States Congress said, look, we've got a budget. We're going to freeze spending. We're going to stop injecting more money into the economy. We're going to freeze for spending until Powell can get control on the demand side. Would that help? You know, I, I feel like giving you advice on, on what to do when I'm asking we're, not getting I our own, we're not getting our own job done. I feel like maybe a better, better thing to do would be for us to get our get our house in order and do the job you've assigned us. Well, let me put it another way. Let's suppose, forget about Congress. Let's suppose that every governor in every state and every legislature in every state got together tomorrow and said, I know it's not like it happened, and said, we are going to freeze our budgets. We're not going to spend a penny more than's already budgeted. Would that help? Would it help? Sir? Would it help with? Would it help? Uh, 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 reduce inflation. I, I, it would depend on, it might, it might, but I mean, it would take, again, I, again, I'm, I'm giving you, a, I'm, I'm scoring fiscal policy. Well, I understand really you're being careful, but Mr. Chairman, we, we, the, the United States Congress, in addition to its regular budget, has spent $7 trillion. I'm not saying all of it was, was unnecessary. On top of that, the Fed's increased its balance sheet from one and a half trillion dollars to nine trillion dollars. Nine trillion dollars. I know you're cutting it back, but we've injected all of this money into the economy, and then people go, well, we have inflation. Duh. Give me some help here. Tell me what we can do. I, um, I, I'm really focused on what we can do. Uh, which is shrink our balance sheet and raise interest rates and, and get supply and demand back into alignment and get inflation back down to 2%. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, Senator Tester from Montana is recognized for five minutes. Well, I want to thank the chair and ranking member. I also want to thank you for, for, for being here, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I, I've just got to say one thing about Senator Kennedy. I think freezing, freezing spending is, is probably not a good idea, except we just had a flood that cost a billion dollars worth of damage in southern Montana. A billion dollars worth of projecting. We free spending, that never that infrastructure never gets rebuilt. So uh, I hear what you're saying, and in some aspects I agree, but it's a lot easier to talk about than it is to do. And I think that's the challenge that, that uh, the chairman of the Fed has, is that uh, he really needs to focus on what he needs to do. And if it was a simple solution, we'd already had it done. Um, I'm concerned about rural America and the impact inflation's having on, on rural America. And I know that, that uh, you have seen it You've seen it transpire over the last uh, several years, particularly as this country's come out of this pandemic. And I know we've had a conversation that it's two-edged, it's supply and it's demand, and you're only dealing with the demand part, which is an important part. And in some respects, Senator Kenny's right, you are probably uh, one, of the, one of the strongest people in the world to be able to deal with some of this stuff. Um, but from a rural perspective, is the Fed doing anything in particular 
that I could take back to my constituents and say, this is, this is what the Fed's doing to help rein in inflation in rural areas. Well, so I, we are, well, of course, well aware. As you know, we have uh, four or five reserve bank presidents who have very large agricultural economies within their districts, and we hear um, you know, excellent reports from them about what's going on. And it's, it's clearly a tremendously challenging situation. Uh, you know, um, fertilizer prices and uh, all kinds of inputs, very, very difficult situation. Can't get parts for your, for your equipment and that right. kind of thing. So, um, you know, o overall, we do appreciate that. You're not seeing this yet, but, you know, when times get, if times do get difficult, then, then we work carefully with borrowers in the farm belt and that kind of thing because we know, you know, that's, that's what you do in those kind of times. That, those are not, we're not at that times at this point, but that's one thing we have done in the past. I mean, overall, we think we need to get back to price stability, and and that will help. That will help everybody. It will help the whole economy, um, including rural America. Okay, interest rates. Um, I know they've been raised a bit recently. I think three quarters of a point. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I'm not going to ask you where interest rates need to be, but I do think that this, there's a fine line to walk. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Where if interest rates are raised too high, it could drive us into a recession. Can you tell me some of the things you're looking at to make sure that doesn't happen? Sure. So um, we, when we pivoted and started uh, talking about raising rates last year, markets have priced in, uh, you know, rate increases so that all out the all out of the uh, the curve of debt maturities, interest rates have already moved up to reflect interest rate increases that we haven't actually made yet to our. So what we have right now is is a low short-term rate, which is our policy rate. So, and the increase that we that we made, we made one decision at the last meeting, which was to raise by 75 basis points, but only to 1.6 percent. So, and we thought that was the right thing to do. I can, I'm happy to discuss why, but uh, really, the the point is that our policy rate is still at a relatively low level, and in principle, we want to get it up to a more neutral-ish level. Uh, even more expeditiously than we had been, and that's what was behind our our thinking. And that's that's really so. The the concern, I don't think, is about the level. It, it was with the speed. Are we moving too quickly? And I think we were we, we were. I was persuaded that it was important that we make this move now and not wait uh, and telegraph it and do it six months six weeks later, for example, or the meeting after that. It was important to do it now because where we are with inflation is having seen inflation come in above target over and over again, and if we said we'd move more aggressively if it was appropriate. We thought it was appropriate, and we did. So what, uh, and, and so you said you, you want to get the things more to a neutral level, uh, and are we to a neutral level now? No, we, so we, we, we estimate the, the longer run neutral level of the federal funds rate to be in around two and a half percent, and actually we think it will be appropriate uh, to, to raise rates above a neutral level into a, a, a moderately, modestly, uh, restrictive level because this is very high inflation and it's hurting everybody and and we need to do our job and and get inflation back on, on a path down to two percent and the way we're going to do that we think is is raise rates of course to that level of course it everything depends on the data that we see we're going to be we're we're, uh, we're you know really strongly committed to getting inflation down to two percent but we're going to be flexible as we see the data coming in do you agree with the perspective and then i'll be done but do you agree with the perspective that if interest rates go too high too fast that it could drive us into a recession it's certainly a possibility it's not our intended uh, outcome at all but it's certainly a possibility and and frankly the events of the last few months you know, around the world have have um, have made it more difficult for us to achieve what we want, which is 2% inflation gotcha. and still a strong labor market. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chester. Senator Haggerty of Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Um, Chairman Powell, one of the many downsides of quantitative easing is the fact that the Federal Reserve and then by extension the American taxpayer is essentially taking a long position in the securities that's acquired, that are acquired. And that means that when rates rise, the value of the securities on your balance sheet drop. That's exactly what's happening today. And as of March of this year, the Federal Reserve had about $330 billion worth of unrealized loss on its balance sheet. That number is probably close to half a trillion right now, given the rise in rates. So my question of you is, do these unrealized losses limit the Federal Reserve's ability to execute its monetary policy objectives? And specifically, 
Will the Fed sell mortgage-backed securities and realize a loss? Or will the Fed be cornered into holding these securities until they appreciate? So those kind of unrealized losses have play no role in our decision making, have no effect at all on our ability to conduct monetary policy. They're just not a consideration. And they won't be a consideration when we when we decide whether to sell and in what quantity MBS. We we said we would look at selling MBS when the the, the normalization process for the balance sheet was well underway. Uh, and that, that means not soon. We haven't decided exactly what that means. When we make that decision and, and the reason, by the way, the reason we want to do that is we're committed to having a mostly treasury balance sheet. And with these higher rates, MBS prepayment speeds have gone way down. And so yeah. to, to achieve the mostly treasury balance sheet, we may well need to, to sell MBS at some future date. When we turn to that, we're going to be very transparent and give lots of uh, transparency, obviously, but uh, it won't be, we won't be thinking about, about the, 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 the balance sheet. I mean, remember that we've contributed a trillion dollars in profits to the Treasury over the course of the last 10 years. The reason we don't have a lot of capital is that we give our capital, that we give our earnings to the Treasury every year. So it's, it's not at all a concern for us. But to be clear, these long-dated mortgage-backed securities may be sold as a loss. You're not limiting your ability to do that, to, to sell to no. loss. No. And that, that, that could happen. I just think that the, the downside of quantitative easing is, is very much illustrated for us when you find yourself in this situation of holding these long-dated securities. To, to turn to another point, Chairman Powell, I realize there are a number of factors that play a role in the historic inflation that we're experiencing. Uh, supply chain disruptions, regulations that constrain supply. We've got rising inflation expectations and excessive fiscal spending. But the problem hasn't sprung out of nowhere. And in January of 2021, inflation was at 1.4%. By December of 2021, it had risen to 7%, a five-fold increase. Now, since the war in Ukraine began in late February, the rate of inflation has risen incrementally, another 1.6%, to a current level of 8.6%. So again, uh, from 7% to 8.6%. Given how inflation has escalated over the past 18 months, would you say that the war in Ukraine is the primary driver of inflation in America? No, inflation was high before, certainly before the uh, war in Ukraine broke out. Uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. The Biden administration seems to be intent on deflecting blame, and as recently as just this past Sunday, spread the misinformation that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the, quote, biggest single driver of inflation. I'm glad you agree with me that that is not the truth. Um, I'd like to turn to, to the situation we find ourselves in now, tightening. A recent survey of global CEOs showed that more than 60% of executives expect a recession in the next 18 months. Meanwhile, per its most recent forecast, the Fed will be tightening monetary policy for the next two and a half years. Thus, the Fed could soon find itself in the challenging position of potentially exacerbating an economic downturn in order to address the historic inflation that's been unleashed by the Biden administration. So, Mr. Chairman, as you know, the Fed has a dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment. As we look to the fall, how do you think about balancing this potential tension between the Fed's two mandates, particularly if the economic outlook worsens, but inflation remains elevated. So we do have a dual mandate, as you point out. Right, right now, um, the labor market is extremely tight and I would say unsustainably hot. Uh, and um, there's a mismatch between supply and demand there. As you know, there, there's a, more job openings uh, than there are by a factor of two to one than there are unemployed people looking for work. On the inflation side, we're very far from our target. So. We think that we have to restore price stability to put the economy back in a place where in the medium and longer term we can have an ex, you know, a sustained period of, of uh, what we would call maximum employment. So that's, that's how we're thinking about it. Of course, we're not, we're not trying to provoke uh, and don't think that we will need to provoke a recession, but we do think it's absolutely essential that we restore price stability uh, really for the benefit of, of the labor market as much as anything else. I agree. I think you have an extremely challenging job, particularly given some of the physical policies that have been undertaken that make your job uh, more challenging than it should be. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Harry. Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome back to the committee. Uh, Chair Powell, it's good to see you again. I want to follow up on this uh, issue of um, uh, in, this imbalance between labor, demand, and <clears throat> supply, as you were just referring to. According to the latest figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 5.5 million more jobs in April 
than available workers. And so we have, as a result, an extremely competitive labor market and very strong wage growth. But inflation is even higher than wage growth, so that's wiping out worker gains and leaving a lot of folks um, with what amounts to a pay cut as they, at the same time, try to figure out how to pay uh, for higher prices for gas and food. So um, let me ask you this. Chair Powell, with, with all of that in mind, what is the basis for the argument that wages are too high and that they need to come down in order to rein in inflation? So it, it isn't that, that wages themselves are too high. It's that the rate of growth of wages is not consistent, it, it, and I'll, I'll explain this, not consistent with 2% inflation over time. So. Of course, it's great when wages go up, and we want them to go up. We want people to get you know strong wage increases. But at a certain point, uh, wages become high enough that 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 companies start raising prices, and and you wind up getting uh, you wind up getting high inflation. So if you just kind of reverse engineer what level of wage increases would be consistent with two percent inflation over the longer term. Today's wage increases, if you look across the, 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 the numbers of measures that we look at, they're, they're significantly above that. Now, there's some evidence that they're flattening out, uh -huh. particularly average hourly earnings. There's some, some evidence that that measure of wages is, is flattening out so that it's no longer going up. So it's really not about reducing wages. It's just, it's just having a more sustainable pace of increases. And what would you expect if wages started to stabilize, as you say, they stop increases, how long would you expect it to be before cons the prices that consumers are paying would start to go down? So I are they ever going to go down? It, it depends in, um, prices don't, they don't have to go down for inflation to go down. So right. prices remain at the same level and infl inflation goes to zero. But um, it depends on, on different businesses. In, in some service, in parts of the service economy, um, labor costs are a very large portion of costs, and so you would think that that, that gets passed through very quickly into prices. And so um, we, we would think if, if you, we would think that that pass-through should be, should be shown fairly, fairly quickly in some parts of the economy, in others less so. But over time, uh, you know, we would want wages to be moving up at, at the highest sustainable rate that's possible. Right. And consistent with 2% inflation. And of course, at the same time, the economy, we've got this very, very strong um, labor market, but simultaneously, we continue to see higher unemployment rates among <clears throat> African Americans, for example, um, nearly double the unemployment of white Americans. So how do you see this, this sort of interplay between um, uh, wage growth and what the Fed actions to cool demand on that um, uh, underlying issue? So we, we don't target wage growth, of course. We, we, our, our job is price stability. Right. We, we look at wage growth because over a long period of time, it's, it's an important uh, factor in determining price stability. So that, that's, that's really how we think about it. In terms of the disparities, we saw those disparities increase significantly at the beginning of the pandemic and then reverse, as, as, we, as we pointed out in our monetary policy report, those gaps have at least returned to Historically lower levels. Um, there's still gaps, though, and those those are those are not really gaps that we can get at with monetary policy. That's but we point them out because they're an important aspect of our economy, and we do consider them as we think about appropriate policy. I think that I think I think I would agree with you. I think that those are sort of systemic challenges in our economy that need to be addressed through um, through the policy that we work on here. You know, it seems to me that. Um, I mean, one, I think we have a labor supply problem in this country, and we should be dealing with that in Congress in terms of what we need to do to make sure that people have the skills and the capacity to do the, the jobs that our economy is creating. But it also seems to me that as long as wage growth is lagging inflation, that in some ways labor costs are actually dampening inflationary pressures because they're not keeping up with inflation. So um, I think it's just an interesting and, and complicated um, issue. No argument there. Yeah. Well, I just have a couple of minutes left. I'm not going to have a chance to get into this, but I'm quite interested also in this, um, that what we're seeing around the country everywhere, and especially in Minnesota, about extraordinarily high increases in housing. The Fed is raising interest rates, um, which is going to, have an in, was going to have an impact on increasing housing prices because mortgage prices are going to go up and other costs going up in terms of building housing is going to go up. So I'm just... Um, interested in how you sort of weigh that dilemma. So um, 
you know, af after the pandemic, uh, for a number of reasons, housing demand went way up. Rates were low, but also people decided they wanted to live more in housing, you know, single family homes rather than downtown. And um, so prices went up all over the country at, at very, very high levels. Now you see the housing market slowing down because you see higher rates are having an effect. That should have an effect on housing prices, um, perhaps even fairly quickly, so that prices won't necessarily come down, but price increases will, will flatten out. We're seeing lower home sales, we're seeing lower starts, so we're seeing a slowing in housing. And you know, I, ideally, we would, uh, you know, the very low settings of rates during the pandemic uh, were appropriate, but but part of part of what that did was it it supported a lot of demand for housing. We're, maybe we're going to get back to a place where where supply and demand are closer. I will say. I agree with you on, on the labor shortage issue, which is a longer term issue that we have, but also with housing, there are, there are constraints on housing construction so that it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's very possible that we'll be in a position where, where ha there isn't enough appropriate housing at the right price. Uh, and that's, that's a longer run issue. Again, not so much for us as for you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Senator. Senator Lummis of Wyoming is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being with us today. It'll come as no surprise to you that I want to focus on digital assets and Fed master accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. So my first question is about the accounting treatment of digital assets, uh, specifically SEC Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. So this bulletin requires publicly traded companies, including banks, to hold digital assets in custody as an on-balance sheet liability. Um, so will the accounting standards contained in this bulletin that requires it to be on-balance sheet be applied by the Federal Reserve to banks and bank holding companies? So that's, so that's something we, we too are saw that and understood the implications and I think that's something we're working on with our with our fellow bank regulators and I don't have an answer for you though but that's a that's a, certainly something we're, we're focusing on very closely right now and and I would note that um, the Basel committee on bank supervision uh, has declined to establish a capital charge for custody digital assets because they're always off balance sheet um, they've created a framework called the Prudential Treatment of Crypto Assets uh, that continues to acknowledge that they're off balance sheets. So uh, if the standards of the SEC's staff bulletin uh, are adopted, that would be the first time that custody assets are placed on balance sheet. Um, do you think it's smart for the U.S. to be imposing bank standards beyond international norms? So again, I mean, that was uh, the SEC has authority over over accounting rules, and this that's what this was. And yep. we now have to consider that exact question, uh, and that, that's what we're doing. I can't really I can't really say more because we are working our way through it. But I, I, my understanding of it is the same as yours, though, which is custody assets are are are, are off balance sheet ha have always been. But this is you know the SEC made a different decision as it relates to digital assets for reasons it explained, and now we have to consider those. Yeah, and thank you. I encourage you to, uh, to, to consider that and appreciate that you're looking at it and you're aware of it. That's great. So I'll turn to master accounts now, of course. Uh, the board and the reserve banks have refused to provide Congress and the public with transparency with regard to the application process. Um, at its core, um, a master account is a public benefit conferred by the Fed to a private institution. And since a master account is a public benefit, really doesn't the public have a right to know which institutions have master accounts and which have applied for accounts and not received them? Uh, both the FDIC and the OCC publicly list similar application information on their websites today. Um, so could you commit as part of a transparency uh, project uh, to make publicly available a list of institutions that have received master accounts as well as the institutions that have applied and not received them. 
So I'll be glad to look into that. I, you know our system well, and it really is that the the Fed, the board, you know, we set rules, but the but the Reserve Banks really make the decisions about granting accounts subject to those rules. And we're trying. We actually think we can improve on that system with the current proposal we have, and are considering comments on that right now, as I'm sure you know very well. Yeah, and so. and as you also know that. Um, applicants for master accounts are getting whipsawed between the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and the banks. Uh, that one says that uh, the, the Federal Reserve says to says that the the banks have all of the authority they need, meaning Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and others have all of the. Uh, authority they need to make these decisions and yet you go to the reserve banks and they say oh no we're waiting for uh, the the Board of Governors and so there's a whipsaw effect and we get no answer the the black hole continues to exist and uh, you know my frustration level has long since uh, been at a boiling point it continues to be at a boiling point there's no responsiveness it's a black hole and uh, I wish to just once again use this opportunity uh, to encourage you to address that. It is, it, it, there's just no excuse. There's no, there's no excuse anymore, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Lemus, uh, Senator Van Holland of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, Chairman Powell. I, I can't let an opportunity go by without raising the issue of the FedNow real-time payments uh, system implementation. You would agree that if we can get the system into place, it will save millions of Americans billions of dollars, would you not? Yes, I would. And so that's why I would just want to encourage you to move very quickly. Uh, as you know, the system is uh, scheduled to go up next year. Uh, we had an earlier hearing um, in May in this committee, and uh, Brookings Senior Fellow Aaron Klein, who spent a lot of time monitoring uh, this system, uh, shared his concern that uh, we weren't moving fast enough uh, to hit that date and fully implement it. So I just want your commitment, Mr. Chairman, that you are focused on this and that it is a priority. Uh, very much so. We're, we're very focused on doing, doing it right and also on time. Okay. And that's next year. Right. Because it especially impacts, of course, people living paycheck to paycheck, right, who, who make a deposit in a bank, but it doesn't clear. Uh, and then they get uh, tagged with all sorts of overcharge fees and things like that. So I, I just, you know, other countries that are um, a lot less advanced in terms of technology, the United States have figured this out, and we should be, we should be there now. Um, I just want to uh, turn to really uh, the issue of the day, which is this uh, challenge in, in navigating uh, between keeping a strong economy moving and low unemployment uh, and dealing with uh, price uh, stability. Uh, on the good news front, and I think you've testified to this earlier, the United States uh, is doing a lot better uh, than our sort of near peer economies when it comes to economic growth and quickly reducing our unemployment rate. Isn't that the case? Yes, generally, we're, we're further advanced in our, in our recovery, I would say. Yeah, so that's, that's good news, and we, we want to keep that going. Um, we also obviously want to deal with the price increases, and you know, the concern which has been shared by others this morning is that many of the causes of those price increases uh, are beyond the control of the Fed. And I call them the three Ps, Putin's war, pandemic supply chain disruptions, uh, price gouging, Senator Cortez Masta raised that. And so I think the challenge is how do you navigate increases in interest rates when a lot of the drivers of price increases are beyond your control? And I, I want to raise a specific kind of case study here, which is in the housing uh, market. Uh, because you would agree, would you not, that increasing the supply of housing can help reduce housing prices, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, but when you, what we're seeing now is that uh, with rising interest rates, obviously new investments uh, are more expensive. Uh, we've seen housing starts fall by 14% in May. So that means fewer housing opportunities, less supply, uh, fewer workers um, engaged in building new homes. So if you could just use that as a sort of case study of how you're going to navigate these cross currents. Um, 
so interest sensitive spending is a is a very important aspect of how our tools work. And in the case of uh, the housing market, what you're seeing is higher mortgage rates. So you're actually seeing demand move down quite significantly. Uh, uh, many, many indicators suggest that fewer people are visiting homes. The wait time for uh, selling a home is increasing. Housing, housing sales are moving down. Housing starts are moving down. And uh, ov overall, uh, it's, a, it's a slowing in the housing market. And um, I, I think what you will see or the for many forecasts call uh, for the increase in housing prices to slow pretty significantly now. You've seen very, very large, as you know, uh, increases in housing prices over the la really since the beginning of the pandemic and to the point where, you know, all over the country you have uh, housing, you know, people, you know, five bids above the ask uh, the second the house comes on the market. Well, that's cooling off now to a more sustainable pace. So. What we hope is we can get get demand to, to that part of the economy to slow to a more sustainable pace, and get housing get get the housing market back on a, on a more sustainable path where there's a better balance between supply and demand. I appreciate that. I'm just going to use my remaining time to sort of push you a little further on this issue, not specifically with housing, but. Given the fact that so many of the factors that are driving price increases are beyond our control, and you talked about core. Um, inflation. Uh, what is your confidence level that we will have what is generally referred to as a soft landing, where we won't overcorrect in raising our interest rates to the point that it begins to really hurt our economy, workers, and wages? What is your level of confidence that you can um, navigate a soft landing for the economy? I mean, it, it is our goal. Uh, it is going to be very challenging. It has been made significantly more challenging by the events of the last few months, thinking there of the war and uh, you know, commodities prices and, and further problems with supply chains. And the, the, the question of whether we're able to, to, to accomplish that is going to depend uh, to some extent on factors that we don't control. Well, Mr. But Chairman, the, yeah, is, if I could, the, but, th but this, is, this is the point I think many of us are making. The factors that are out of your control are not going to be susceptible to those costs being brought down, oil, gas, I heard you early, food, by the, by the measures you're taking. And, and the risk is that the measures you're taking will slow down other parts of the economy without getting us the benefit of lower prices. So uh, I think that is a big theme today, and I just um, look forward to continuing our conversation about how you're going to thread that needle. Can I, can I say the, that the, the other risk, though, is that we would not manage to restore price stability and that we would allow this high inflation to get entrenched in our economy. And we know from history that that, that will hurt the people we'd like to help, the people in the lower income spectrum uh, you know, who suffer now from high inflation. That will hurt them more than anyone. So that we, we can't fail on that task. We, we have to get back to 2% inflation so that we can have the kind of labor market that we really want. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, but as you know, the prices that people are experiencing most vividly day to day is the price of gas at the pump and the price at food at the grocery store, both of which are things that you've said right. are beyond your control. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Senator, I'll Senator Daines from Montana is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, it's about good to see you that you're here today. Like my colleagues, I continue to be deeply concerned with the inflation we're seeing in the economy and its real-life impact on Montana families. When I go back home, I hear the top three concerns from Montanans. It's inflation, it's inflation, it's inflation. It's the price of gas, it's the price of groceries. CPI inflation grew 8.6% year-over-year in May, the highest increase since December of 1981. In Montana and other mountain states, as you're aware, inflation grew by 9.4% versus a year earlier. This rate of inflation is unsustainable for Montanans and Americans alike. And for months, for months, Republicans in Congress and even some Democrats, like former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, warned of the massive inflationary risk of the $2 trillion March of 2021 stimulus package with that post to the economy. In fact, just pulled up the Washington Post article <clears throat> from March 29th, 2021. I remember being in this very room, similar hearings, warning, 
warning our colleagues about the risks of moving through a $2 trillion spending package when we had a $1 trillion of unspent COVID money still remaining in December of the prior year. Let me quote from that Washington Post article. It says, Summers, of course, now remember Secretary Treasurer Clinton and uh, economic advisor to Barack Obama, a Democrat, Summers, 60, age 66, who drafted economic blueprints for the past two Democratic presidents and was a top candidate to lead the Federal Reserve Board under President Obama, has emerged in recent weeks as the loudest critic of President Biden's approach to reviving the pandemic-era U.S. economy. The Harvard University professor who advised Biden for a time last summer warns, and this is key, that the president's stimulus plan may trigger the highest inflation in more than half a century and could cost Democrats the chance to make lasting investments in the economy. There were many of us warning the administration and our colleagues across the aisle of blindly moving forward on a purely partisan basis to jam through that $2 trillion package and the inflationary risk associated with it. Now with inflation at a 40-year high, these same Democrats are continuing their ill-advised effort to revise President Biden's sweeping build back broke package, no matter the warning signs that are flashing right now in all of our faces. Chairman Powell, Mr. Summers has suggested several years of greater than 5% unemployment might be necessary to contain inflation. Would you agree with that assessment? I, uh, I guess I would say that um, I don't want to comment on other people's, on other forecasts generally, but my assessment is that uh, uh, it, it's going to depend to a significant extent, extent on factors like how long does the war run and how long does it take supply chains to, uh, to improve and that kind of thing. There's a lot of uncertainty around that. I would have a lot of humility about trying to, you know, predict with any clarity exactly where the economy is going to be in, you know, the next three years, for example. But my, my assessment, though, is that um, there's certainly paths to get inflation down uh, to 2% uh, with, uh, with outcomes that are uh, substantially less you know, troubling than, than what you just read. You've uh, characterized a soft <clears throat> landing as getting back to 2% inflation while keeping the labor market strong. What's your confidence that the Fed can achieve this goal without causing a recession? So I, I think that is our goal. That's, that's our intention. Um, I think it's going to be very challenging. Uh, we've never said it was going to be easy or straightforward. It's going to be challenging, and, and uh, the events of the last few months have certainly made it more challenging. And uh, nonetheless, there are pathways through which that could happen. And in particular, um, what we saw in, in the, the early part of 2021 when inflation went up was uh, very strong demand surged against what were unanticipated supply side constraints. And the result was prices went up a lot, much more than could be explained by just the, the increase in demand. And so in principle, if demand can move back down, then inflation could move it back, back, back along that path just as quickly as it went up in principle. No one's guaranteeing that, but the idea is this is not the same, it, you know, it, you, there are relationships in the economy for how quickly inflation would move uh, compared to demand moving. This could be an unusual situation because we have, we have have had what is in effect a vertical supply curve where there isn't any more supply or a very steep supply curve. So you get really sharp uh, increases in prices. You could get sharp declines for the same reason. So that, that could be a difference. Uh, and I, I think we'll find out, ideally, uh, but ultimately, we need to see progress on the supply side, and we're not waiting for it. You know, we, our job and our tools work on demand, and, and that's what we're working on now, is getting demand down to a more sustainable level so that supply can catch up and is in better balance with demand. Chairman Powell, thank you. Thank you, Senator Daines. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Ossoff, on behalf of the chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, welcome back. Um, let me state at the outset, uh, you have an extraordinarily challenging job in extraordinarily complex times, uh, and um, much of what you are responding to and adapting to is beyond your control. Uh, 
your success is the country's success to a significant extent. It's the world's success, and um, I fervently hope for your success and appreciate your continued efforts. I'd like to ask you uh, to specify, if you can, what transmission mechanisms you believe are most sensitive right now to the change in monetary policy, uh, what forms of consumption you expect to be most sensitive to it, um, and the extent to which you anticipate that uh, some of the effects that you hope to have on aggregate demand through the increase in rates uh, are transmitted via financial markets, and if so, how? So I, I guess I would say three basic channels through which our, our tools work. The first would be interest-sensitive spending, so that's, that's durables, including cars and things like that, durable goods, uh, housing, for example. Uh, so when rates go up, uh, spending on those uh, Purchases, which tend to be financed with debt, will be restrained. That, that's one major, major channel. Um, the second is just asset prices generally across the economy. When interest rates go up, uh, it raises the cost of holding assets. It can cause uh, assets, again, broadly across the economy to either moderate their growth or decline somewhat in value. And that has an effect on a broad effect across the economy on spending on, on everything. The third channel is really the exchange rate which you can think of as, as another asset price, but that, that also uh, you know, has the effect of, of pressing down on inflation. So we look at all of those, starting with the first one, you, you, know, we, you can see um, we just talked about the housing market. The housing market is the classic part of the economy that's very sensitive to, uh, to interest rates, and you, you're going to see a moderation in housing demand. You're going to see declining, uh, or slower increases at least, in housing prices. So those are the those are the three main channels I would point to. Let me ask about on, on, in terms of asset prices uh, and how financial markets are responding to the Fed's stance. Uh, I've consistently asked you and and Secretary Yellen when you appear before the committee to talk about systemic risks, risk to financial stability, um, risk of financial contagion, uh, where you're moving swiftly and markets are volatile. There are perhaps. Uh, institutional trades that could rapidly unwind or exotic financial instruments that no longer function well. Uh, what do you anticipate to be the uh, parts of capital markets now or the phenomena in capital markets that present the greatest risk to financial stability as the Fed takes the aggressive action that you're taking? Well, I would, I'd start by saying that the banking system is very strong, well capitalized, highly liquid. Um, does a much better job of understanding the risks it, it runs and managing them than before the global financial crisis. And that's, that's a reflection of the work that regulators did and that the banks did to, so that part of the financial system is, is critically very strong. And, and we saw that through the pandemic and we, and we see it now. Well, to your point though, capital markets did show uh, real periods of illiquidity during the, um, during the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. And so we've been looking at ways we, I say broadly, the yep. regulatory community has been looking at ways to address that. Um, so you remain concerned about money markets? Well, that's a different, so money markets are, that's a, that's a, a part of the economy which, uh, where, where it has become illiquid uh, because the assets that they were invested in were, were not able to be turned into cash quickly to, to fund depositors wanting to take their money back. So we, we stepped in and had to provide that liquidity for the second time. There are reforms going on there at the SEC which should address that, and, um, and that they're in the process of being uh, considered and then implemented. So that should help on that front. I was thinking more of the Treasury market, for example, where, uh, which it became illiquid when, at the very beginning when people wanted nothing but cash, nothing but the, sh the cash and most cash-like things. Treasury market has been functioning, though, all through this period when we've very significantly changed the stance of monetary policy. So markets have been functioning well, reasonably well. And, um, and Okay, my time is running short. I uh, appreciate that. We'll probably follow up to talk a little bit more about financial risk. With my remaining few seconds, uh, let me ask you this. How would you characterize um, the share of responsibility, if you will, on the supply side versus the demand side for the elevated price levels over the last year? Um, to what extent do you believe that you mentioned the supply curve being steeper than expected, and so the uh, uh, increased durable goods demand and consumer demand having a, a greater than expected uh, effect on prices. Right now, 
is the principal driver of the increase in the price level, elevated consumer demand, elevated demand, or is it supply constraints? I know we're facing both, but I'm asking you to allocate as you can some share to each phenomenon. Yeah, I, I just would say it's clearly uh, both factors are, are principally at work here. You, you couldn't get this kind of high inflation without strong demand, and you certainly couldn't get it without the kind of supply issues that we've had, both in the labor market reflected in high wages, and then in, in the goods market reflected in what's happened with, with uh, um, durable goods. And, and cars in particular, you look there, there's a, it's been this driven by semiconductor shortage. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the Chair, Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, thank you for your presence here today. Uh, let me start just by uh, making certain that I tell you something that I think I need to say on behalf of Kansans. I've never seen the level of anxiety, uncertainty, concern for the future as I see today when I have <laughs> conversations with folks uh, in my neighborhood and across Kansas. There's a sense that something's not right. Inflation is a significant component of that feeling. And the inability to know what's around the corner is terribly damaging to folks, both financially, but also mentally or psycho uh, psychologically. There's a real circumstance out there that I want you as the chairman and your colleagues to know uh, exists. Uh, it is. I think uncertainty and, and what the future holds is one of the most damaging things when people try to figure out uh, their lives and how comfortable they are. I also want to highlight a, a particular Kansas, but middle America across the country issue of agriculture. Um, I was on a farm uh, on Saturday uh, participating in, observing harvest of wheat. We live in a world in which people are starving and more are going to starve uh, if we are unable to, uh, if we fail to get more grain into markets from Ukraine and from Russia, but from the United States as well. Uh, agriculture farming is a noble calling and it has a lot to do with being able to feed people who are now desperate. Uh, part of the concern in regard to agriculture is a is the interest rates have a significant consequence to the profitability, to the survivability of, uh, of producers. Uh, and um, profit margins get squeezed if uh, interest rates continue to climb. climb we face uh, declining or, or lower land values. That creates greater access to credit challenges. Tell me how you see uh, one, how, how I can assure my Kansans that, and Americans that things are going to be better. And two, how can I assure farmers and ranchers that their future will be brighter based upon the activities of the Federal Reserve? So I, I take the, um, the sort of very low confidence readings that we're reading about and, and your comments about Kansas citizens as being pretty directly related to high inflation. And I think people haven't seen it. You know, mo most people, you and I are old enough to remember what it was like. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, it, it just really does uh, destroy public confidence in, in the economy and that kind of thing. So we need to get uh, inflation back down to 2%. And all I can say is we're, you know, we're using our tools to do that. And uh, the public should believe that we will get inflation back down to 2% over time. Again, there are factors that we don't control, but those factors do tend to wash out over time. Things like commodity prices don't tend to just keep going up. They may remain high, but they essentially they're quite volatile over time. That's what the record shows. So I, we, there, we will, we're doing what we can to get inflation down, the parts that we can address. So I, I, for whatever that's worth, that's, that's what we can do and what we will do. In terms of the agricultural patch, um, as you know, we have, uh, uh, including your Kansas uh, City Fed president, we have some terrific people who are Reserve Bank presidents who give us a good sense of what's going on in the agricultural sector uh, on an ongoing basis. And it's obviously a very, very difficult time with fertilizer prices and difficulty in getting all kinds of inputs. And um, it's just a very challenging time in, in the agricultural world. We do understand that. Um, our part of it is to, is to do what we can to get inflation back under control. I know higher interest rates are painful, but that's the tool we have to 
moderate demand and get uh, demand and supply back into balance so that inflation can come down. Mr. Chairman, in a conversation you and I had <clears throat> on the phone, you indicated that, it, as you did today, there are certain aspects of inflation that you have little control over. One of them, I think you mentioned, was energy. Uh, let me be reassured, if you would, that there are no, that, that there will not be uh, actions by the Federal Reserve to make lending to fossil fuel producers a component of the policies of the Federal Reserve. That when you say you have little to do with it, you could cause great damage if you decide uh, to go down a path that was at least contemplated by a number of nominees for the Federal Reserve Board. And I would love to be reassured that's not a component that we would that you would pursue and that we would not see resulting increasing a cost of fuel as a result of federal policy, yeah. federal reserve policy. In my view, and I think the view of what I, my view certainly is that it's not our job to allocate credit to or against or away from any particular sector of the economy. That's a job for elected officials or for markets, if, uh, but it's, it's not a job for, for the Federal Reserve, which has a mandate to you know, pursue maximum employment, price stability, a well-regulated banking system, and a, you know, and a sound payment system. Mr. Chairman, thank you. On behalf of the Chair, Senator Warnock. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, uh, for being uh, here again today. Georgia is in a serious housing crisis. And uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta has designated owning a home in Atlanta as unaffordable to the average home buyer. But it's not just a city problem. Uh, it's urban, it's rural. Harrelson County, a county with a population of less than 30,000, is also rated as unaffordable. In the midst of this housing crisis, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, which has uh, a tough mandate and a tough time of uh, managing um, inflation has raised the federal funds rate by 0.75%. This means mortgages are about to get a lot more expensive for families. Chairman Powell, as the Fed raises its interest rates, what is the Fed doing to prevent this rate increase from further exacerbating uh, the housing crisis? Well. So by raising rates, um, we're clear, you're, you, what you're seeing is a slowing housing market now. You're seeing because of, because of higher interest rates, mortgage rates have gone up pretty substantially, and you're seeing a slowing in the housing market. And that should mean, one of the things that should mean is that housing prices should stop going up at such remarkably rapid rates. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had um, you know, a very, very hot labor market, uh, sorry, housing market all around the country, and you know what what should take place is as demand moderates in the in uh, demand for housing moderates for new for new and existing homes. You should see prices stop going up quite so fast. You're also uh, also going to see uh, fewer home sales and just a, just generally a, a lower rate of activity in the housing market. Um, so really, what needs what needs to happen is housing supply and demand need to get back into better alignment. Um, and you know the part of that that we can control is really is really by moderating demand, so that prices stop going up quite so much, and that we can get back to a, a housing market where supply and demand are. Now we, we don't control supply, and there, there's all there are issues in this country around housing supply. Um, it's harder to get land and lots and things like that. It's harder to get people to work. So there there are supply side constraints if you meet with builders from around the country, they will tell you that we have a longer term issue as a country around creating enough housing supply. That is not something that the Federal Reserve can do anything about, but it is an important issue. Right. Notwithstanding that, mortgages are clearly, at least in the short term, uh, are about to get more expensive. And it seems to me that what would be helpful is if the Congress would pass my Down Payment Toward Equity Act uh, to help first generation home buyers afford their first home. What effects do you expect the Fed's interest rate increases will have on the, well, let me put it this uh, another way. The Federal Reserve helps enforce the, the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. What plans do you have to ensure that as interest rates increase, 
everyone still has access to a fair, reasonable price mortgage. So the higher interest rates don't change our very important obligations under fair, the fair credit laws that we enforce. And so we'll continue to enforce those, um, you know, transparently and, and uh, aggressively. Um, uh, it, 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 is, it is true, though, that mortgage rates have gone up, and, and that will slow down demand, and that will be pay- that there, there's some pain involved in that for people paying higher mortgage rates, and also some people will be priced out of the mortgage market. But that is ultimately what, we, what needs to happen if we are to get back to price stability to a place where people's wages aren't being eaten up by inflation. Right. So the, the, pain, the greatest pain would be if we, if we allow this high inflation to just continue. Uh, yeah, I guess will be right. Yeah. Right, and I guess my my point is that in in the meantime, the folks who are on the margins of the marketplace in the first place. We the issue is how do we protect them as much as possible. R- related to that, uh, when Secretary Yellen was here, she stated that the Federal Reserve needed to not only be skillful, but she said, "quote lucky, lucky to ensure quote a soft landing." I I don't like counting on luck uh, when the economic safety of Georgians particularly those at the margins, is at risk, which is why I'm doing what I can uh, here in the Senate. And I've introduced a couple of bills to lower the price of gas, to lower the cost of groceries and other everyday goods, to cap the cost of insulin and other medication. Uh, and I've held the White House accountable to pursue investigation of price gouging of ocean carriers. And I've supported bipartisan legislation addressing the same issue that just became law. How, how can Congress lower costs? for Georgia families? And what steps can Congress take to support the Fed and ensure a soft landing? So I, I guess I'd be reluctant to give you uh, advice uh, while we're, we're trying so hard to do the job that you've actually assigned us, which is to get inflation back down. But uh, um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think those are, those are authorities that those of you who run for elected office have and we don't have as, as mere appointees. So. That's really up to you. But you, you would agree that the folks at, at the margins of the economy are feeling the most pressure and pain, and that has to be addressed. I, I think that's that's always the case, and in the case of inflation, it does. It, it's um, it's really that if you're if you're spending every dollar that you're intaking on the bare essentials of life, and they and the the cost of them goes up ten percent, you're in trouble right away. Right. Whereas middle class people and and people better off than that. They've got some resources, some ability to deal with it. So that's, but that's why it's such a priority to, for us to get on top of inflation before it does become entrenched. Inflation's only now been around for, you know, we've been, it really didn't start until March of last year. So it's, it's not at all too late for us to, to get this job done and get back onto the kind of path we all want to be on. Thank you so much. I'm concerned about this, and it's why, in the meantime, I've introduced several bills to lower the cost for essential items like gas and groceries and and medication. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator. On behalf of the chair, Senator Sinema, I think, will join virtually. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for joining us today. And congratulations on your recent reconfirmation. You know, the inflation numbers continue to be concerning, and this is the number one issue I've been hearing about from Arizonans. Families and small businesses are paying higher prices, and they need relief from soaring inflation so they can make ends meet. But we also know that this is not only a U.S. problem. Countries around the world, both big and small, are also seeing high inflation. So how is the U.S. position relative to other countries with respect to inflation? Um, I'd say our, our level of inflation is broadly comparable to that of other major economies. You saw Canada uh, released their inflation number today. It's not far from where ours are. Same with the Western European democracies and the United Kingdom. Um, uh, but the, but there's, there are different compositions. So the, I would say generally, to generalize, in the United States, our inflation is, has more of a demand-driven component, whereas in, in Europe, it is more to a greater extent, driven by very high energy prices, for example. Um, although in the, the United Kingdom kind of has, uh, has a mix of, of both of those. We also have high energy prices here. So the levels are similar, but the, the composition is, is a little bit different here in the United States. 
Well, thank you. You know, crypto markets have experienced substantial volatility in the past several weeks. Has the Fed been tracking these events and what implications do they have for how the Fed is viewing the broader economic outlook and making decisions with respect to monetary policy? We are, we are tracking those uh, events very carefully, of course, and, you know, not really seeing significant macroeconomic implications um, so far. And, uh, uh, but um, I, I think the principal implication is, is really what we've been saying and others have been saying for some time, which is that in this um, very innovative new space, uh, really there is a need for, um, uh, for a, a, a better regulatory framework that treats, you know, it, 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 the same activity should have the same regulation no matter where it appears. And that isn't the case right now because a lot of the a lot of the uh, digital finance products are, in some ways, quite similar to products that had existed in the banking system or the capital markets, but they're just they're not regulated the same way. So we need to do that. And I think I think that that uh, is uh, the main takeaway I would have. Mm. What is an appropriate proportion of current U.S. inflation to assign to? Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and how are you thinking about these events in the context of setting monetary policy? Well, I would say that you know the, the the increase in commodity prices are are clearly connected to to the war in Ukraine, um, and uh, so that that part of inflation um, um, would be certainly much lower. Uh, if uh, than it is without the war in Ukraine, and you know, there really, there's nothing that our tools, our tools work on demand, and there's a job for our tools to do here. There is a there is a, a job to moderate demand so that it can be in better balance with supply, but it it wouldn't. Uh, we we don't think that we have the answer to higher oil prices, uh, you know, due to the global um, oil situation. Mm. I know the Fed tracks the core personal consumption expenditures index closely when thinking about monetary policy. Many trends in our economy, including a big shift towards technology and e-commerce, accelerated during the first year of the pandemic. And it's possible that the indicators and weights used to measure inflation may need to be revised to accurately measure inflation as Americans are experiencing it. So we all know inflation is high, but how high it is matters to ensure that we have an appropriate response. Congress and the Fed should make decisions based off the best information that most accurately reflects the challenges that families and businesses are facing. Have you given thought to this issue? Well, um, yes, in the sense that um, we, you know, we look very carefully at the way, um, the way we measure inflation in this country. We actually use personal consumption expenditures, which is a little different and, and uh, a better approach, we think, than the more traditional consumer price index. Uh, this was a change we made about 20 years ago, and I think economists generally think that PCE inflation does uh, a better job of measuring the inflation that people are actually experiencing in their lives. So that, that is what we do, and we keep it updated. You know, it, the, the, uh, the, the uh, government agency that, that manages it keeps it updated on a regular basis, so we think that's the right uh, the right approach in terms of measuring inflation. Of course, we look at CPI as well, um, but uh, we've we've chosen to, to to make PCE inflation our our principal uh, measuring stick. Mm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time's expired. I, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, I want to start on the issue of diversity at the Fed. Uh, I have a letter that we sent you yesterday and signed by nine senators, including five members of this committee, urging you to undertake a number of simple reforms to the process for selecting bank presidents and Class B directors. That process has to include meaningful transparency and public engagement if we are ever going to have Fed leadership that truly represents the public as required by the Federal Reserve Act. So I'll wait for your written response, because we just sent that letter, on the details of those proposed reforms. But for now, can I have your commitment that you'll provide us with a substantive response by July the 22nd? Yes. Thank you. And also, will you commit to work with me to put in place real, 
meaningful changes to the process so we can have a broader array of voices to the Fed leadership? Uh, I'll commit to, to having a, a frank discussion with you about that and, and what, what could be. We're open to ideas of how to improve. As you point out in your letter, we've, you know, it's not like we haven't made tremendous strides as it relates to the BNC directors in the course of the last 10 years. We really have. And the, the, the diversity numbers are, are, I think, quite impressive for the BNC directors. The A directors, as you point out in your letter, less so, but those are appointed by the bankers in the district. Uh, but we, we can have this conversation. Well, I look forward okay. to it. Less so, but uh, it's not, it's worse than less so. I mean, you don't have one bank president in the history of the Federal Reserve who's been Hispanic. That's, that's, that's far worse than less so. I was talking about directors, but yeah. you, you're right about, you're right about, uh, about that. I and, and there was a tremendous opportunity and it didn't happen. Um, I just continue, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm the lone uh, effort on this, but 62 million Hispanic Americans who represent $2 trillion of domestic uh, purchasing power uh, deserve a seat at where some of the most important economic decisions are being made. Uh, so we look forward to uh, the engagement that you've uh, said that you're willing to engage in. Now, um, I am trying to find out, as others have raised with you, uh, there's no question that painfully high inflation is affecting every family in America. But in order to develop the right response, we need to understand the underlying factors that are driving price increases. Um, I think you've said here today that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, pandemic-related supply chain issues are perhaps, uh, and the energy issues that flow from Russia's invasion of Ukraine are perhaps uh, some of the biggest factors in driving inflation. But the question is, how is it that raising interest rates on those underlying causes of today's inflation uh, ultimately are going to change it? You know, energy is still energy. Um, supply chain is still supply chain. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a continuing challenge for, uh, for the world. But there's nothing about uh, interest rates that's going to affect any of that. No, but but notwithstanding that, there there is there are major parts of the economy where the demand exceeds supply meaningfully, and that's where our tools have a job to do, where we can moderate demand and give supply time to recover, so that supply and demand get back into better balance and inflation comes down. Well, it seems to me that we can all recognize that raising interest rates is a blunt tool uh, at the end of the day. But I'm looking, going back to the beginning of my questioning, uh, it's essential, I believe, to be mindful of the effects that your actions, your meaning the Federal Reserve, will have on unemployment, particularly for those groups that were hit hardest by the pandemic. The Fed's latest monetary policy report states that, quote, employment for blacks and Hispanics not only declined by more uh, than that for whites and Asians early in the pandemic, uh, but also recovered more quickly since the end of last year. Now that we're potentially entering a period of larger and more frequent interest rate increases, what do you expect will happen to the unemployment rates of black and Hispanic workers relative to the population as a whole? Well, it'll depend on, the, on what happens to the overall unemployment rate. Um, and, you know, our goal is to achieve 2% inflation while still keeping the labor market strong. That's, that's our intention with this. Well, I, I appreciate what your intention is, but I would venture to say uh, that what we will see is what we have seen in the past, that crisis after crisis disproportionately harms Americans of color. Uh, so I hope the Fed's response to inflation doesn't continue that trend, because it is woefully wrong that one group of Americans disproportionately faces consequences of policy decisions versus the rest of America. And this is another reason to have people at the Federal Reserve who represent this community to share those insights uh, with the Fed as you determine these macro policies that are going to affect our communities disproportionately. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Powell, in response to a question from 
Senator Warner and a question from Senator Sinema. Uh, Senator Warner more or less asserted that we're all in the same boat in terms of inflation globally, but you made the point uh, on two different occasions that uh, what's driving inflation in, in largely Europe, a little bit less so in the UK, has to do with spiraling uh, energy prices. Could you talk a little bit about beyond the pain at the gas pump and the increased cost of transportation, how increasing, uh, and I should say, and I, I believe that Europe is where they are, uh, this is not for you to comment on, uh, because they moved a little bit too aggressively and didn't look at resiliency with some of their uh, their energy inputs uh, that were largely affected by the Russia invasion. But could you talk a little bit about the other uh, in, the other commodities that are affected by rising interest rate? I'm we're talking about housing, and we know that pipes, a number of inputs to housing construction, have gone up. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the? market basket of other commodities that are that are influenced by increasing uh, energy prices? I think energy prices go in go into a lot an awful lot of different uh, places in the economy, in, including, you know, as an input into um, into manufactured goods of all kinds and plastics, particularly and things like that. So it's it does, um, you know, it's a big contributor to to inflation, not beyond just the actual energy prices. Yeah, and so the, you know, my only comment here, and then I just have a closing thought, um, is that we are unilaterally hamstringing your ability to bring inflation down. You don't have to respond to this; it's a policy position um, by artificially increasing the cost of energy in this country. If we simply would recognize that there is a way to get to a transition to green renewable energy and make the glide path sustainable, we could easily separate ourselves from the rest of other Western democracies with respect to that tool, which is not in your toolbox. Um, and, and hopefully we can get to that discussion and, uh, and, and embrace the idea that the transition is inevitable. It's a matter of timing and resiliency in the meantime. Um, just uh, one other question. I know the post -F uh, FOMC press conference you ruled out a hundred basis point increase. Is that a long term view or a view based on the circumstances as you, as you see them today? In other words, uh, would that be something potentially on the table if the measures that you are uh, taking right now do not work out? I think we, I would never take something off the table for any and all purposes. Um, you know, the committee. Uh, will that I chair will will make whatever moves it believes are appropriate to you know to restore price stability. Okay. Well, I uh, I, I for one am, am glad you're at the helm. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in you, which is why I voted for your confirmation. Um, but we will be submitting some questions to the record back on the points that I made in the opening statement about transparency. There is some frustration, and I have to say it's bipartisan in terms of questions that we're asking and not getting answers to. The uh, master account is one of them, but there are other items that we'll just include for the record. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you for serving. Uh, thank you, Senator Tillerson. Thank you for your cooperation in this hearing today and a busy day for a lot of people. And Senator and, and uh, Chair Powell, thank you. I have a series of questions. I have not asked my questions. I was saving them for last. Um, uh, but and then after my questions, we'll adjourn. You, you said that Russia's in aggression to Ukraine Port congestion and COVID lockdowns in China especially have contributed to higher prices. Consumer uh, spending continues to be strong. Many Americans, most Americans probably worry about inflation. Talk, talk for a moment, if you would, about the strengths of the American economy now and whether or not you see positive signs of prices stabilizing. Well, um, consumers are overall, not every consumer, uh, but overall, the consumer sector is in very strong shape financially. There's, as you know, a very substantial accumulated quantity of, uh, of savings on balance sheets, less so at the very bottom of the income spectrum, but right across the rest of the spectrum. And so that's there to support spending, even in the face of higher inflation. And you're seeing consumer spending hold up uh, pretty well. Um, sorry, the rest of your question. Well, are there positive signs of prices stabilizing? So, in terms of prices stabilizing, uh, you know, what we're what we're looking for is, you know, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down, and we we don't have that. So, nothing I could point to says that we have that. I will say 
that core PCE inflation is a, is a pretty good indicator of where underlying inflation is is running, um, and and it, it has moderated over the course of this year, reasonably significantly from where it was uh, in the latter part of last year. Still way uh, higher than it needs to be. We need to see a lot more progress, uh, but just it's been running at a rate over the last say four four or five months that is that is lower than it was at least. But again, still still far too high. So we're looking for that. We're not really seeing it yet. Uh, you know, there there are lots of of stories about there out there how this should happen, and, and uh, some people think it's very clear that it will. And you know, until we actually do see it happen, uh, we need to keep keep um, keep moving. And I want to be clear from your comments publicly, your comments to this committee today. Uh, you see the you you say the economy is not at the point of a recession, correct? I don't see the <clears throat> the likelihood of a recession as particularly elevated right now. You should know that um, no one is very good at forecasting forecasting uh, uh, recessions it, it very far out. We're we're just we just no, no one's been able to do that regularly. So, but I, I would say that um, you know the U.S. economy for now is strong, and uh, spending is strong. Consumers are in good shape. Businesses are in good shape. Clearly, financial conditions have tightened, and you're seeing growth slow from the very elevated levels of last year associated with the reopening. You're, you're, you're seeing the beginnings of job growth slowing to more sustainable levels. And, you know, there's risk in that. There's, there's obviously risk in that. We, monetary policy is famously a blunt tool, and there's risk that, uh, that weaker outcomes are certainly possible, but they're not our intent. And as I said at the beginning of my testimony, or the, the, my opening statement that uh, a couple hours ago, that our economy is growing faster than China's. Let me ask a few simple questions about gas prices. Uh, we've heard a lot today about gas prices from both sides. Just a few yes or no's. Does President Biden set gas prices? No. Does Congress set gas prices? Not as far as I know. Do you, as chair of the Federal Reserve, set gas prices? No. I wouldn't ask you to assign a sort of quantum responsibility, but starting with the decisions of OPEC and the world's major oil companies to not produce more, can you tell the committee um, briefly what goes into the price at the pump and ultimately what tools you have, Congress has, other government agencies have to bring the price down? It's really principally the, the price of oil, which is set globally by the actions of large, largely by the actions of large oil producing countries. And then it's the you know the, the the refining spread, what it costs to refine, what the, what the refiners can charge, uh, to before the public consumes that that refined product. So that those are the two pieces of it, and we we don't have really our tools certainly don't work to address uh, either of those things. Uh, let me talk for a moment about housing. Uh, several have asked about the skyrocketing costs for both renters and aspiring homeowners. Uh, prices over the last two years, but prices weren't that great prior to President Biden in the last administration either, we know. Last year alone, rents went up more than 11%, grew faster than wages. Short, what are the short-term and long-term effects on inflation in our economy if renters see more and more of their monthly income going to housing? Well, that will crowd out other, other kinds of spending, and that, that's, you know, the the very fast increases in housing uh, prices over the last uh, couple of years have been very broad across the country and, and, you know, unsustainably high. And that, of course, speaks to the importance of building more housing. Uh, last question I want to ask before adjournment. We've seen cryptocurrency values collapse by some two thousand, so by some two trillion dollars in markets crash over the past few weeks. Consumers losing money, workers losing jobs. The monetary policy report highlighted the risks of stable coins, digital assets that aim to maintain a stable value in order to trade cryptocurrencies. Talk for a moment, if you would, about the financial stability and monetary policy risks that these assets pose and how are stable coins different in your answer include how stable coins are different from the U.S. dollar, which has the full faith and credit of the United States behind it. A stable coin is a is a an instrument really that is backed up in it. There's a, there's a, a reserve that has um, securities in it that are meant to, to assure the value of that, uh, you know, of what's it, let's say it's a dollar stable coin. So it's, it's meant to assure that, that, that your interest is actually worth a dollar. So 
that sounds a lot like a money market fund, for example. And and the way money market funds work is they're very there's great transparency about what's in the reserve and their requirements about what must be in the reserve in order to preserve that that one dollar value. The the world of stable coins is is new and emerging, and uh, uh, it doesn't have uh, the, the the sort of fit for purpose regulatory scheme that it needs to, and I, and I think that's something you've been hearing a lot across the board from uh, a number of federal agencies and from from our own Treasury Department, which has been leading an effort to to try to put in place. And I, many members of Congress now have proposed new frameworks for regulating stable coins and digital assets generally, and that's that seems like a, a wise thing. And you don't. It, 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 Clearly SEC, clearly CFPB, um, other agencies, the Fed's role in regulation of cryptocurrency in your mind is what? Well, that's, that's one of the issues is who, who really does have authority over this, and that's something c Congress would need to clarify. What we, we, would, we have authority over what banks can and can't do, some banks and bank holding companies. Uh, the SEC has some jurisdiction, has jurisdiction over securities. The CFTC has, to, has relevant jurisdiction. So part of this will be sorting out, deciding what these things are and how they should be regulated. There are also, there are stable coins that are really used in connection with the crypto trading platforms. That's most of what happens now with stable coins. But there are also some stable coins, and, and even more potentially, that will be used in payments broadly. So that would be two different kinds of regulation there. It's just an area where Congress and, and Congress is investing bandwidth and, and pro looking at proposals and something like that. And, and that, that's, I think, a healthy process that should lead over time to something that has bipartisan support and puts in place appropriate regulation for the whole, the whole area. Let me drill down for them. my last question. What, so what, what if Congress doesn't act on, uh, I understand that uh, the, the Commodities Future Trading Commission understand what you said about SEC, do, does the does the Fed is the Fed directly involved in any of these regulatory actions uh, regarding cryptocurrency absent Congress action? Just just the what you know we regulate banks, regulate and supervise banks, and so we we have a say in what our banks that you know the uh, Federal Reserve regulated banks and bank holding companies do with crypto assets on their balance sheets, what activities are permitted and that kind of thing. Does that of course, suggest, the OCC is, is at that table, and so is the FDIC. Does that suggest that, uh, that a number of American banks are cautious because of your oversight of them on crypto? I, I mean, American banks are interested, in, are now very much exploring, are there profitable opportunities to serve our customers in this new space? And of course, what we're doing is saying, let's be sure that that takes place in a way that, that preserves and supports safety and soundness. And we've, we've had a, a you know, ongoing set of meetings and collaborations with the FDIC and, and the, the OCC. And the, that's ongoing, I guess, between us and the OCC. So that, I think that's, that's an appropriate way to carry it forward. But it's not a substitute for what I think is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it's, it's like any other major area of innovation. Ultimately, Congress will come together to create a regulatory framework that, that is more fit for purpose for it, as it has in, in so many other cases. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair Powell. I uh, look forward to continue working together. For senators who wish to submit questions, those questions are due one week from today, Wednesday, June 29th. To Chair Powell, please submit your responses to these questions for the record for no more than 45 days from the day you receive them. Thank you again for your testimony. Committee's adjourned.